Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Monday, so what is the date today? September 16th Finance Committee meeting. Uh, we have two items on the agenda this evening, uh, two sizable capital improvement plan appropriations. One is for seawalls uh, with an amendment in accordance with the bid. There has been a uh, change from the originally requested amount, which we sent to committee for $14,320,000. That's been amended to 17820 since. So either uh, we'll take a vote here or we'll take a vote in the regular session um, to accept as amended. Just a roll of attendees. No, oh, thank you. And do the opening meeting. All right. Um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Kroll. Sorry, what is this for, Mr. Chairman? Just attendance. Attendance? Present. Council DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Hughes. Yep. Council Liang. Present. Council Mahoney. Council McCarthy. Council Palmucci. Chairman Kane. Present. Kane. Present. Uh, pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Um, okay, so now we'll start. Um, so as I said, we do need to take a vote uh, on the amended change for this request, which I think we can do in the regular session. So for now, uh, I'd like to invite Dave Murphy from Ty and Bond uh, and Al Graziosa from the DPW, who are here to answer questions about this appropriations package that's before you. Yes, Councilor Hughes. Just by way, just, just, I know that we're gonna get a presentation, but I just want to make a motion to, to put it on the floor to approve, but. To approve yes. as amended? Yeah, yeah, as okay. amended. Oh, we can't go, we have to re-advertise. It's going to be advertised. We can't move. Hmm. So we can't move approval on this amount because okay. it needs to be advertised. Well, it needs to be advertised. Yes. Right. Yeah. Council McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you also to yourself uh, for our conversation a couple of weeks ago to pull this out. Um, as I think uh, everyone here knows, it's a uh, a major priority to keep this moving and. Um, before we start, uh, we have several neighbors in the area uh, that were uh, affected by the storm. Uh, there have been uh, multiple community meetings with tremendous input from everyone from uh, House Neck all the way up uh, to Marymount, Chickatawbeck Beach, Post Island. Uh, we had multiple meetings and um, it, it was done very well. I, I have to commend all, all the neighbors and, and the four gentlemen in the front row, uh, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Grazioso, Mr. Costello, and Ian um, from uh, Tig and Bond, that um, they just did a tremendous job putting the package together. Um, I love the, the notion of Kirsten moving to approve as amended, but I know we can't. But uh, it's something that um, is overdue. It's something that we have worked at very hard in, in, in analyzing um, drainage, seawall height, uh, impact to the marshlands down there, and it's just a, um, a very well uh, put together uh, project uh, by, uh, by the gentleman in the front row, and um, the neighbors were instrumental, and I can't uh, say enough about the mayor uh, uh, not saying no to anything to, to make sure that public safety was number one. So. Uh, I just wanted to put that in. I know that this was on my watch right at the beginning, and um, it, it, it wakes you up right away when something like this happens, and you have to get into the game, and um, it was, uh, it was uh, very well put together. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to you, but uh, kudos to, to a lot of people in this room. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Good Councilors. Uh, with me tonight, City Engineer Paul Costello, Dave Murphy, and Ian Mead from Tie and Bond. Uh, before you this evening is an appropriation request of $17,820,000. This appropriation covers three critical areas, seawall construction, drainage improvements, and a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers hydraulic study of the Willows culvert. Dave Murphy from Tie and Bond has a brief presentation of these improvements. And following the presentation, Dave and Paul Costello will answer any questions 
you may have regarding the seawall, pump stations, and the drainage hydraulic study that has been proposed by the Army Corps of Engineers. So at this time, and also any grant reimbursements, we can talk about that this evening. At this time, I'd like to turn this over to, to uh, Dave Murphy. Thank you, Al. Um, thank you, counselors, and the, the general public that is here. Um, in your hands or in your possessions should be uh, a packet that we provided, uh, the full set of plans, construction documents, some of the permits, some of the bid results, the recommendation to award letter is in there, plus some other materials. They should have also been provided to you electronically. Um, hopefully you had a chance to at least a peek at them. Uh, tonight we wanted to talk um, briefly about uh, the storm that occurred last year, uh, the areas of the proposed seawall, uh, the actual bid results that we went through. We had a, a long bid. We started the bidding in July. We opened the bids at the end of August. Uh, the hydraulic analysis and the stormwater pumping that we want to recommend and also the Willows, the Army Corps study. Uh, as we all remember, the storm from 2008, Storm Riley, was ex extremely impactful to the city. Uh, a significant number of homes were flooded. Uh, damage occurred across the city. Um, significant um, uh, surge occurred. Uh, and obviously it just highlighted the need for the seawalls to be immediately addressed. Uh, some of the pictures, just to remind everybody of you know, some of the rescues that had to occur, some of the emergency repairs that had to occur across the city, and some of the significant damage and flooding that occurred. Uh, a tremendous amount of attention has been paid by the uh, Department of Public Works and Engineering uh, to address these concerns, and as, as Councilor McCarthy said, a tremendous amount of public outreach occurred uh, just to get people's feedback and we indeed uh, received just tremendous, tremendous feedback uh, to help guide actually the design. Uh, some of the, the one of the, the key areas obviously is along C Street the, as we look suddenly, uh, westerly rather, along C Street uh, towards the Post Island Road area which was uh, particularly hit hard. Uh, we, it highlighted a lot of drainage improvements that were needed. Uh, a lot of outfalls, so you'll see somewhat in the design that we, we accommodated that. So all the, all the drainage structures now take care of the 100-year uh, return frequency storm. Uh, the existing seawall, as you can see some, some of the pics on slide 7, uh, are, uh, they're at the end of their design life. Uh, and indeed, during the hour, uh, storm Riley, they took a, a tremendous beating. Um, the actual location of the project, uh, I have a, a, the, um, the laser up on the screen, starts at uh, Chickataba Ave, far, far to the west. It runs at an easterly all the way to the beginning of House Neck, where the stone is at the intersection of Babcock and C, uh, about 7,000 lineal feet. Uh, and then the second phase, which is under design now, uh, being worked on with the city engineer, Paul Costello, uh, runs from that, that same intersection at C and Bab Babcock, all the way to Bayswater. Uh, so the full, the full project along this section of the city uh, will be done in two phases. Uh, the permits, I won't list them all off, but you have the list of them there, of extensive. Uh, every agency that wants a, 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 a say in this project has had their say. Uh, we've been at this for two years uh, in the permit process. Every time there's a minor change, each agency wants to know that change. Uh, everyone. Um, has had their say, and uh, one of the, the primary concerns we've had is that uh, they do not want any encroachment, any not an inch further onto the beach, uh, so we've had to stay within the existing footprint. Um, so all of those have been submitted. Uh, we've had great success with those permit agencies. Typical seawall design right now, as we have, uh, you'll see as we go a little further in the presentation, we're recommending a two-foot increase across the entire length of the seawall. Um, the second slide will show a four-foot increase. Um, uh, the two-foot increase includes taking the existing revetment that is there, rebuilding that as needed, uh, pouring a cast in place, uh, leveling slab on top of that. Uh, there is, you'll notice there are helical, oops, sorry, there are helical anchors built in uh, <coughs> onto the front of the leveling slab. Uh, that, the, those helical anchors are designed to accommodate the four-foot increase uh, so that we can't just build the two foot increase to start, we have to make sure that whatever is done now can accommodate the additional two foot on top of that in the future. Um, the sec this second slide does show the, the, the two by two block on top. Uh, so this shows the, uh, the full four foot increase rise on the seawall. We are proposing this section for the portion of Turn Road. It's about 1,300 lineal feet for now as a, as a recommendation and two foot for the rest of the, the length of the seawall. 
This is the area here on the, on the screen showing the section on, uh, the, with the beach along Turn Road. It's about 1,300 lineal feet. We're recommending a four foot, whereas we shift back over to along Shelton, uh, back to a two foot increase because of the topography. And then as we proceed easterly along this, the seawall, continuing two feet. Um, the, so for the Adam Shore Seawall, we are recommending an award to MIG Corporation. We've done the full reference checks, their, their bond ratings, their insurance, uh, all of their job performance, uh, and they, they pass muster. Um, we're recommending a two-foot seawall increase the whole length, a four-foot seawall increase for that section along Norton Beach Turn Road, uh, and that for that section of Norton Beach, a four-foot increase for the stair heights as well. Um, Jumping now into the hydraulic section, the second project, uh, but very much integrated. Um, uh, there are three areas along this stretch. Uh, one is Bayswater Road in Winthrop, where there's a tide gate, and uh, significant flooding occurred during the storm, and is subject to flooding by the FEMA, FEMA results. Um, the second area we have is um, the, the Post Island Road area where the marsh is, uh, significant flooding, significant concern, although we're raise, recommending to raise the uh, the seawall two foot in that area. We also want to supplement that with um, stormwater uh, hydraulic analysis and pumping systems. And then the, uh, that's just another shot, the same area. Uh, Turn Road, um, the beach area, Norton Beach, uh, that's a third area that has to be studied hydraulically just to make sure that um, the, the two foot wall or the four foot wall in that area is sufficient. So the Adam Shore drainage improvements, we're recommending a hydraulic study for those three areas, uh, proceeding in a permanent design and construction of a stormwater pumping station in that area, uh, and that is a $2.8 million request. Um, the third project uh, that's before you is the Willows Culvert, also intricately related. Um, the, the hydraulic study for the three areas plus this one area, um, is, this is the two culverts um, that go under the, the end of Ray Dyke. Um, just a zoom in of the same area. The culverts are, are along Rota Street, you can see them. Uh, the back, if you go around the back side on Rota, they, you could clearly see them and on the front side. So if I go back, uh, you can see the, uh, from the, the uh, slide, the, the salt marsh on the, that's tucked between the dike and C, C Street uh, is not doing very well. It has very little salt water, uh, tidal flush in and out. So the Army Corps and EPA would like the city to seriously look at this. This area, as you may know, was flooded uh, during Hurricane Riley. Uh, sorry, Storm Riley, um, and the water was not able to drain out because those culverts have been blocked for many years. So the, the, the plan is to do a hydraulic study with the core and have them look at a way to increase the, 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 the ebb and flow of the tide into that area without causing any flooding of the homes in that area. Um, so the Army Corps study is again looking at the two large box culverts, um, looking at how it's been impeding salt water, um, and doing a 50-50 split with the core in the city. Uh, so the city's portion would be 120,000. Uh, and by doing so, and by going with the Corps in this method, it preserves the ability to obtain Army Corps of Engineer construction money for that project. Uh, finally, the recommendation that we're putting before this, uh, the, the council uh, is $14.9 million for the first phase of the Adam Shore seawall that includes a 10% contingency in engineering to oversee construction. Uh, the second one is $2.8 million for the hydraulic study and the drainage improvements. Uh, the third one is 120,000 for the, um, the Army Corps study for a total of 17.8 million. Uh, there are uh, multiple uh, uh, funding sources that we've been working very hard. Uh, Commissioner Grazioso and, and Paul Costello have been supporting the, the submission of these grants. Uh, we've been working hard with the executive office. We, it appears as though we may be eligible for $3 million of construction money from the executive office, uh, $5.2 million from FEMA as a result of the storm because we are improving the seawall, uh, an HMGP grant uh, from FEMA uh, for the Chickatawbit area. It was a grant that we had applied for three or four years ago that we thought went dormant, uh, and some other uh, um, applicant fell off the list, so we rose to the top. Um, and then finally, there's a PDM grant uh, potential for the drainage improvement. So the total potential funding uh, that we've identified is 10.9 million. Uh, this concludes uh, my presentation. Thank you, Dave. Councilor Wang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do have a couple of questions, but I'm gonna start with the funding since that's what we just ended on. So I don't know um, who in DPW can answer questions about the funding process, but I'm just gonna start there. 
you repeat the question, please? Yeah, I just, I, I'm going to start with the funding since that's where we ended on the slides here. Um, and specifically, you know, I first wanted to say that I do appreciate that with all of the work that we've been doing across the city here, that this administration has been really strong in, in finding and in applying for whatever grants we could possibly get to afford these improvements we're doing across the city. So just logistically speaking, you know, what is the process going to be for when these funds are going to be approved? And then if and when these grants come in, you know, does that then offset any payments for short-term borrowing or long-term borrowing? I mean, how, do we, how are we going to factor all of that in? I could speak to the schedule of the grants. Uh, I'll let uh, Commissioner or Paul speak to the, um, you know, the other portion. Uh, the, the executive office grant has been applied for. Um, it's before the, 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 the governor right now. Uh, the feedback we're getting is that uh, they've been supporting this project all along, and the maximum is $3 million, so it, it's, it's looking positive. Uh, we no guarantees, but looking very positive from the, the grant uh, folks. Uh, the FEMA PA grant, we've been working almost a year and a half now with them, uh, providing an exorbitant amount of materials and documentation. Uh, they've changed staff, so we continue to supply them. Uh, that should be awarded this fall. Okay. Um, the HMB uh, GP grant should also be awarded this fall. All, all three of the top ones is this fall. Uh, the fourth one, uh, the drainage improvement, uh, is being applied for again. Uh, the first round, uh, the city did not was not successful, so we're reapplying for the same grant with FEMA, um, and that will be the late spring. We would know on that one. And do we make the necessary changes in order to be able to be considered for this grant again, since we weren't able to get it the first time? Yes, we're repackaging it, uh, adjusting the cost-benefit analysis, um, and, and attempting to, to put our best foot forward again. Yes. Okay, and then the 17.8, is that excluding any of these grants? So that's approaching it with this thought that worst case scenario, we don't get any of these grants, we do need a full 17.8, correct? Correct, all of the grants are reimbursable. So you'd have to appropriate, award, spend, and then they reimburse the city. Okay, and then again, just logistically speaking, if we get then all the grants in, after the 17.8 is spent, well, well, where will those monies go? That's a question for the Commissioner. Thank you. It, Dave, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that once we start construction, you, you only get um, reimbursed for work moving forward? Correct. Okay. Um, so, and I think Eric might be the person that, talk on this, we won't, I don't think we go out and borrow the whole entire 17 million in a bond. I believe we would do uh, bond anticipation notes. And Eric, do you want to talk, oh, yes. talk about that? Um, yes, from Councillor, from a procedural standpoint. So say uh, we end up getting $5.2 million reimbursed. Mm -hmm. um, since it's a construction loan, what it would be, there's basically what would happen is the bands go out immediately to fund the project then reimbursement occurs. We receive that fund under what's uh, called non-recurring miscellaneous revenue. That comes in and that would offset the debt service payment to match that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's done fairly common with every reimbursement grant. It's, uh, the state has a nice procedure and we follow it pretty tightly. But yeah, that reimbursement would come in offset any debt service or net expense from it. Yeah, that answers my question. Just um, knowing that when it comes, because again, during budget season, whenever we look at our debt service, it's helpful to know that if and when grants come in, that it'll go directly towards that. So yeah. thank you. No, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. Um, the second question I have still has to do with the timeline, but it's more with the construction work. And so I know Council McCarthy mentioned a number of his constituents are here in this room, but people at home watching as well. Uh, what can we anticipate as far as timeline for physical construction goes? I mean, there's quite a number of phases in here. Um, including the pump station. And so I know, you know, this isn't something that's going to happen overnight, but just um, if and when the, the monies get approved, you know, what is the timeline that we're looking at as far as construction goes from start to finish? Great question. When we put the bids out uh, that were received, the contract documents right now uh, have the contractor starting March 1st. Uh, that gives the city hopefully ample time to fund it. Um, it also provides for the, the contractor uh, being able to, to do the precast seawall units. He has over a thousand precast seawall units he has to cast uh, prior to delivery. So there's a lot of work that goes on uh, prior to starting of construction. So March 1st would be this construction start time. We've estimated and given the contractor nine months to complete the seawall construction. As far as the drainage goes uh, upon authorization, um, the hydraulic analysis and design would start. The hydraulic analysis would go first. Um, immediately following the vote, uh, and then the design would, would uh, follow up thereafter this spring. Okay, so if the design is going to be done in the spring, then 
Does that have to come back in front of us for approval once we get the design? Or is that something where once the design is finalized, the construction will just start and move forward at that point? Well, the permits, the, the, the permitting phase is, is going to take almost nine months to a year as well okay. after design is completed. And then the, so the, the request for the $2.8 million will include um, hydraulic analysis, design, permitting, and construction. Gotcha. Okay. And then <clears throat> I just want to also know if you can help me answer this question. What's the estimated lifetime for these improvements? I mean, it's a capital improvement, right? We hope that, you know, these repairs and, and this construction will sustain us for decades if possible, you know, not any climate change with sanding. I mean, whatever's going to happen will happen. But, you know, I'm sure we're planning for these repairs to last us quite a lifetime, right? So do we have an idea on how many years it should last or when we would have to revisit it? Yes. Uh, tie and bond is, is submit a design report to the city. Uh, this has a design life of 50 years. 50 years, um, okay. In, the, and that the goes ability, for the pump station the ability, as well, or this is just for the seawall we're talking about? Just the seawall right now. Okay, and then my last question just goes back to, um, again, logistics around how this is all going to work. So let's, let's say we're looking at a March 1 start date um, for the construction and the work to begin. I just know that the DPW also has uh, quite a number of projects on their hands, and I'm not by any means trying to question their capability. I just know they're committed to getting the work done and it keeps them quite busy. So, you know, are there going to be folks contracted specifically to work on this project to get it done in a timely manner? Or will these people who are going to be working on this project also be working on other capital improvement projects across the city? Um, the city has re is placed in into the request for funding uh, sufficient funds for an outside consultant to oversee the construction and provide the, all the engineering services associated with that. That said, Paul Costello's staff will need to be still managing the consulting staff overseeing that. So I'll, I'll let Paul speak to his capabilities. Or, or Thank you. Just one, uh, on one question, this company will not be doing any other work at the same time in the city. Uh, so, so. Thank you. you. Paul Costello, city engineer. Just wanted to reiterate what I was saying. Um, tie and bond is not working on our water main projects. And they're not working on the roadway projects. Um, MIG, the contractor, is not working on any of those other projects as far as I'm aware of. So um, it's just a separate project, separate phase, separate consultant, separate contractor. No, that's great. Again, you know, I mean, this is a necessary project and, you know, quite a bit of funding is going into making sure that it happens. And we just want to make sure that given the timeline that you guys are projecting, um, I want to make sure that you guys obviously have the resources you need to to get this done um, sooner rather than later. So I just wanted to know, again, you know, physically who is going to be responsible and who's going to be on site. And that's helpful to know. And I do understand with projects like this, ultimately, you know, Alan, your department, um, you guys will be overseeing it. So if residents have any issues or any questions, they don't have to chase folks necessarily and tie in bond or MIG, but they can go directly to your office, correct? Great. Thank you. Um, before I finish, Mr. Chairman, I do just want to uh, very quickly say thank you to Council McCarthy. I had the opportunity to go um, to a meeting that he held, and it was, I think, after almost the third or fourth meeting in this process. And the number of residents that were there, you know, involved in the process from day one, and you know how involved you were in this and advocating for it as well. I mean, I, I really commend the work that you were doing. Folks that had reached out to me, who were wondering what was going on. Um, you know, once I connected them to you, they were off on their way and they were very happy with the information you're sharing with them. So I know this was a very long process for you and I want to thank you for, for your work. So thank you and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Kroll. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good evening, Mr. Murphy. I just uh, you know, want to vocalize the fact that uh, you know, I understand the importance of investing to mitigate flooding and drainage. Um, you know, before my colleague, Council Palmucci, you know, took office and did a, did a lot of things over in the cross street section of uh, West Quincy. I grew up there and uh, I remember the terror every time it would rain and my parents going down to the basement, literally the, you know, the basement uh, flooding up over the head. And, you know, I saw some of the pictures throughout this last storm and, um, you know, water is absolutely a force to be reckoned with. So I, I see the value and uh, the necessity, quite frankly, to, uh, to be investing. Uh, in this particular program, um, to sort of, I guess, round out the discussion that uh, Council Yang had, had brought forward, you know, it obviously comes down to, you know, the financing component, right? Which, in a perfect world, uh, we'd be financing, rough math, about seven million dollars, right? If we were completely successful in all our, our attainment of grant money, we'd basically be financing seven million dollars, right? But we also budget in the event of, you know, sort of the worst case scenario, right? So we 
we finance the uh, the complete package. What, what my and I support I support this mission. Um, I'm just more I guess curious as to is this just a full anticipation to be a general obligation bond? Is that what we're looking at, Al? Anybody? Any counselor? Uh, yes, it would be a general obligation bond. Okay. Uh, we'll be a ban, and then with the right. idea that if yeah. we had to finance it long term, it'd be a 20 year bond. You're looking at a 20? Yes, that's about the service of lifespan they'll give you. Um, sometimes so, special, a special scenario, you can go up to 30, but 20 years is really. Long and obviously, this isn't in the downtown, so your, <clears throat> excuse me, your bond anticipation note or your, your ability to borrow on a short interest only capacity is what, one to two years? Yeah, Roughly. so it's two, there are two notes, so each a year long at about 2%. We've been getting actually better than 2%. I think last time it was like 1.3%. So um, my question is, I, I don't know who would answer it, Mr. Mason, maybe not yourself, but I'll just kind of put it out there. And thank you for uh, sort of profiling the debt schedule. I don't know if that made its way around to the council, but it's important to, uh, to sort of check in where we're at yeah. with respect to uh, you know, revenues and obviously the expenses that we incur. Was this, do you, do you manufacture this like in-house or do you work with, so does this come from Cinda at First Southwest? Like how does that process work? Yeah, so what happens is the concrete stuff that's already been bonded or banned, um, that comes from Cinder. We get a yearly debt book. It's about, it's about three inches thick with every note, explanations, all that. And then we apply the projections over the top of that. Um, so every time a note comes up, every time we discuss debt service, um, there's a model done. It's pretty, uh, um, they're pretty standard models so they don't really differ. Like if Cinder, I prepare one, or uh, myself and RKG prepare one, they're off by fractions of a percent. Uh, it's pretty standard practice. So one of the notions that kind of came into uh, my mind over the last couple of days as I was you know, preparing and reading the material for this evening's meeting um, is one of the tenants to qualify for a hotel motel tax is seawall repair. Now, I don't know what's been the approach or thought process around utilizing that funding mechanism, but as we know, um, for those folks that don't, the hotel motel tax, every time somebody comes and you know, rents a room at one of the hotels, a portion of that goes into this account, which you know, is talked about a lot up here as not being a burden you know, on the taxpayer. So the way that I see it, um, and I'm gonna get to a question, is that particular account, you know, has a fair amount of revenue in the tune of maybe 1.5 to 1.8 million dollars? Uh, that's less. So actually, that's yeah, that's less the um, the liabilities that we currently incur in that account. However, and this is maybe the the takeaway homework, and I'll put it in the form of a question. Uh, right now because we went through and used that particular account for a $27 million bond authorization that you know covered a whole host of like park type items. That's my understanding still in the one to two year of bans, right? So short term interest only. And there's gotta be a projection somewhere that when that, that liability now becomes a bond, what do we, you know, what are we on the hook for out of that account? Yeah, so there's a projection for that. Yeah, is, is no, that I, I'm very confident that, uh, that there is, but I guess, you know, to offset the general liability to the general fund, or as Councilor Yang had said, you know, the debt service schedule, are we contemplating the use of hotel motel tax? And if not, maybe, I guess, why? I don't know if you can answer that, but that's um, sort I can of answer it kind of in a broader stroke, is that we contemplate, we contemplate all revenue sources, be it uh, state programs like grants that you're seeing, general obligation, hotel, motel. As of now, it sits in front of you, it is a general obligation bond. Um, I would see if Mr. Walker had any additional insight on that. Sure. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I would, to the council. This question, I would just say, would the administration would be happy to review uh, the hotel, motel tax uh, revenue, and if there's an appropriate way to divert or use some of that funding to offset the, the bond costs, uh, we'd be open to taking a look at that in the future. Thank you, and, and I think just from a timing perspective, obviously, you know, Council McCarthy had made mention of it here this evening. Um, due to the advertising requirements, there's no action on this particular package this evening because it's, you know has to be properly advertised for a whole myriad of reasons. But I guess you know, my thought is, if you could take good project, which this is, 
and you know has a tremendous amount of elasticity in the neighborhood and essentially put a funding mechanism on it that's outside of the general tax base i think that just takes uh, you know, a good project and makes it, uh, you know, a great project. So I certainly, um, I guess what, what I'd be interested in, Eric, you're great with this, if you could just maybe put together a schedule for the council that shows what our obligation will be once those bans for the park bond become bonds. And obviously that'll kind of show us what our, our net is and we can hopefully augment this as a, as a primary funding source to keep, you know, the burden off the general fund. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's my comments, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Mahoney. So, thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on a couple of, uh, couple of things that were brought up earlier. Could we just go over the, um, the, the schedule again? So you're gonna be going out for bid in the fall. So the bond we're looking to, to do is the 17.8 $17 million roughly for all of the work. And then we have about $10.9 million of potential funding grant that we could get in, correct? Correct, with the exception that we've already gone to bid. Bids were opened on August 29th. Uh, MIG was the, the apparent low bidder that we've recommended for award. So, I'm sorry, say that again? The seawall construction has already gone out to bid. It bid okay. over the course so of the So we selected that, the, the seawall construction. So, so that's the part that will start in March, though, when they, they that's start? That's correct. Okay. Yes. And um, I guess the reason why I'm asking that is because, and I'm certainly in total support of, of doing this um, in sooner rather than later, because mm -hmm. obviously um, it was tremendous what happened, and we don't want to see that happen again. And it, it feels like we're, I always feel like we're behind the eight ball with these things, but you have to do it right as well. And I think that took the time and the energy of the neighbors and Councilor McCarthy, as well as all of you coming up before us. But as I'm looking at this, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to get confused as to who says, I think it was our, the, when we were talking about the bond, um, if we were to get this, we would, we would be in general obligation for the $17.8 million, and the, and the grants would go against that, correct? Yeah. Just let me clarify that, Councillor. Um, I guess what I'd want to try to say is that would it be possible that we could tie a schedule, like a projection schedule, to the money so that the money is, we're actually spending the money on what's supposed to be spent on so that when the grants are coming in, we can kind of see how the grants are offsetting against the, the bond that we're being asked to take out so that should in the end we end up needing $7 million, not $17 million, we can see that schedule kind of work together. Okay, so... Um that's part of the general mechanics. Sorry, the general mechanics of how the council order is worded. Yeah. So it's your authorization per this specific use. Um, so say we only spend ten million dollars of it, or luckily we only spend say seven million dollars of it. Mm. Um, it's not like you could bond that for a different reason because the council language itself is tied to that. Mm -hmm. The reimbursements come in as a as a source of revenue, right. which is tied. Which pays down the bond. Yeah. So I understand that, but when I'm reading um, when I'm reading the order that's before us, it's 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 rather loosely stated and then we don't talk about the schedule and we're not actually tying it to any, because when you're, when you're reading it, you're talking about the sum of the money for purposes of making certain capital improvements, including seawalls and a pump station in the Marymount Adam Shore area. And it doesn't tie into any potential offsets of those, those grants that are coming in to make sure that they're tying out together. Because in the end, what you could do is you could take out extra money and potentially, if we had extra money, we could, we could apply it to something else. But in this particular case, we want to make sure it's bundled together in this and it's actually, it's actually handling this particular project not being used anyplace else. It's a question. Well, this question. Um, yeah, well, it's an authorization, it's appropriation, so that's inherently an expense. So you're tying a revenue to it. I'm not exactly sure how legally that would work in a council order. That'd be a solicitor's question. Not yeah, inherently we, but inherently we say that all the time and, and, and we don't always get everything the way we want it. So I just, I guess I want that tied in. I would like to see that tied into the language that we have it tied to the schedule so that we're actually, we, we, we're saying that that's a proper procedure, but I'm saying I'd like to potentially see that as an amendment to say that it's tying into the schedule so we can see that this bond is working with the grants that are coming in and offsetting. If we don't get the grants, we get to use the money. If we do get the grants, it offsets that, and the money that's not used rolls back into the general fund, and we won't be paying that debt obligation, correct? Well, the reimbursements come into non-miscellaneous recurring revenue. So that comes into the general fund. That's not, that will, it would find its way to offset the tax levy of that. Yes, I need to make sure it finds it. I need to make sure it finds it way to offset when it comes into the general fund. I want to make sure it's offsetting there. It's, it does. It, it's, I know you're saying it does, but it's but they're two different things. So I, I, I want to make sure it's tying into that schedule. Um, 
I may not be saying it correctly, but I'll, I'll try to get the words to, to, to correct it. Could I just also then, I think it's also for the scheduling for the second phase when we talk about the actual, um, the actual pump station. So it's going to take about nine months to start the seawall, nine months to, to do the casting and then also potentially put the seawall in. Is that correct? From start nine to months from March, we should okay. be and then substantial for the completion. And, and for the pump station, what's the schedule? Just to reiterate, um, the schedule for starting on March 1st is due to the fact that the contractor has to precast over a thousand blocks. Mm -hmm. um, normally, they precast four, three to four to five a day, so it, it's months and months of preparation to get those blocks precast. So, when they start in March, yes, the schedule to substantial completion would be nine months from that date. So, the, so the blocks are being built once the once the funding gets approved. The blocks they start building the blocks, and then. Dependent on how many blocks that they have built, will start sometime in March, potentially March first. But if they don't have all of, do they have them all built before they can start? They do not need to have them all before they can start. No. Okay, so we'll have a, a, enough that they can start, and then at the same time, are we talking about the pumping station, or is that a separate schedule? Is it starting on March first as well, or is it a different? It's a schedule? separate schedule. It's a separate, uh, the, when, when do you anticipate that starting? Based on appropriations and signing of contracts, uh, the hydraulic analysis would start immediately. That's about a three-month process. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, running concurrent with the Army Corps hydraulic study that goes on at the same time. Uh, once that is done, recommendations will be, will be made to the city engineer. Uh, once that is accepted, then we're looking uh, into conceptual design. We get it to about 50% design. That'll take you know two, three, maybe even four months to get to that phase. Then we'll start permitting. Depending upon how much impact there are and what permits we have, it's likely that that permit is going to take about, what permitting will take a year to a year and a half to complete. Uh, once that's done, then we go to bidding. Uh, that's another two to three months of bidding and a contract award. And then you have construction, which will be probably two to three months. Okay, so total timeline for that? <laughs> I didn't add it up. <laughs> I would guess you're looking at at least two years. Two, two, three years. It sounds two to three years. Two All right, so they're, and they're two totally different projects, but both time bond and who is the other, who's the other group that's working? We don't have, we don't know who's doing the pumping station yet because it hasn't been bid, correct? Correct. The okay. pump station has not uh, gone to bid, no. Okay, and then but MIG Corporation out of Acton is the low bidder um, that was for the pumping station for the seawall for the seawall, and then um, I think it was um, um, Commissioner um, was just stating that we would have Paul Costello. You'll have a special person that will be will be hiring in the bond. We actually have somebody that you're going to hire as a consultant that will manage the project, and then somebody from the city will then be managing. Who will who will that be, and how will we manage that? This is, a, this is a key part of this because we have a lot of things that are happening in the city right now and we have a lot of this, I think this was leaning towards um, maybe what, I don't want to speak for counseling, but I think we have a lot of things that are going on and sometimes we don't have the manpower to actually chase down to make sure these things are happening correctly. This is a very, very important project and we need to make sure that, um, we're, that we're checking and balancing everything that we're putting into it so that the neighbors in the neighborhood that we're trying to protect and the tax dollars that we're investing into it, are, we're getting back <laughs> what we're expecting in that return. Uh, we anticipate the tie-in bond will be uh, procured to assist with the construction administration. Okay. And um, we have in-house staff. Uh, we have several senior engineers and junior engineers that are capable of... Will it be one person or will it be a team of people? It could, could be a team of people, a couple a of people. Um, what were the, is there a schedule that goes along with... Have, have you done it before? And is there a schedule that goes along with a project like this that you anticipate um, the time that would be... I've worked on several seawalls in the past. Yeah. Um, the specifications are very clear. Mm -hmm. That's a very good document that went out to bid. Um, so our office, uh, all the staff, the DPW will assist time bond and, and overseeing those specifications. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the liability insurance and so forth will fall on tie and bond. Um, our staff will assist with the constituent service part of it, mm -hmm. uh, answering phone calls. Uh, this year, we hired somebody specifically for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I anticipate we can could, we could manage it very well with a lot of the water and road work that's going on simultaneously. I guess my concern is, is that we have a lot of different projects, a lot of things that are going on in the city, and I just want to make sure that we have the manpower to actually pay attention to this particular project. Um, I think sometimes we, um, in particular, we have a lot of, just again, I'll go back to, we have a lot of things going on, and we don't, we don't necessarily have enough manpower to actually manage the projects that we have going on at the same time. So it either we take on too much and we we run short sometimes or and in this particular case it's a very it's a very specific especially for the seawall part it's nine months we don't know what the pumping station because that sounds like it's a two or three year portion with 
a lot of um, permitting that's going to happen. Um, so that's a little bit longer schedule, a longer leeway until we get to the construction part of, of it. So I guess my, my look is the next, um, from March 1st forward, nine months forward, to, to understand who that team is and to be, and have that shared with the council so we know. So should we get phone calls to assist Councillor McCarthy um, of any of the problems that we're having, which I don't anticipate them. I just, you know, I, it, every day there's new things that happen. Um, it's important that we know that who's on that team. So that's my only concern is that we make sure we, we handle that correctly. Um, you know, I'm going to go back to the to the bond and the, the money and the, the the offsets. So, I understand what you're saying, and I understand that you're saying it's it's handled traditionally like this, and that. But again, in the in the language of the order to which is before the council that will approve, we're approving seventeen million eight hundred eight hundred thousand dollars with the offset of potential funding sources. I'm not saying that I'm not in favor of of approving this budget, what I, what I would like to see is somehow written in here that the offset of, included in the authorization of this um, before the council, the possibility of those funding sources being offset so that it's tied together in a schedule that goes with it. I know that you said you wouldn't be taking out all of the money all at once. Is that true? That's true, correct. Okay. So when you take, when we talk about those schedules, you want to see those offsets, whether or not we're taking it out and we potentially have other monies that are going to come in through the general fund to be able to offset it. It's important that we understand what the, how those things are going to work. Um, and it's not tied in here. It's very, it's just kind of open-ended. That's my only concern about that because we're, not, we're showing the possibility of funding sources and I get that they're just possibilities, but we want to be able to have it written in the language of um, the order that we'll be voting on that we are anticipating those monies to come in to offset that as well. Um, this is an important project for this particular part of the city, but we actually, we have, when, we, when we approve this, it's going, to be, it's going to be funded by the general tax dollars, and we want to make sure that we're, we're being, are doing our due diligence when taking this money out to represent the taxpayers as a whole so that we can always manage um, each other's issues and each other's sections of the city when they have it, because we do need to, to take care of this particular issue that's before us, too. So I would like to see somehow that we could adapt the language so that we could adapt, add in um, the schedule of, of, of monies that's going to offset with the possible funding sources so that we, we won't have extra money on the table. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a question there because it goes back to the point I brought up earlier, which is it's yeah, a legal I, well, I just it's just that it's very loosely written, and I think that there's a way that we could actually put in language here that we could tie it to the schedule, the money to the schedule, and the, and the, the offsets of the possible sources of funding. Again, that's a, there's a legal component to that, which is the reception of revenue, which is beyond. I, I don't. I can't answer a question on that. That's. A, I handle the financial side, not the council. Okay. I'll come back. Let me. Just, I'll, I'll look it up. You myself. say you'll be back. I'll, 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 I'll try to find it on my own. My like own. Arnold. Love it. All right, Councilor Debona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to, just to get us up to speed of where we are today, um, the team of you guys. Um, the commissioner of DPW, engineer, time bond, you guys conducted um, four different separate meetings with the different neighborhoods, Marymount, uh, Adam Shore, Howes Neck, and then a combination of the, uh, the Bayswater uh, section. Um, you got input from the residents of these particular areas, anybody else that was open to the public, as well as uh, Council McCarthy and myself um, that attended these meetings. And then um, you also conducted workshops downstairs to get input get some better aerial views of what's going on and came the consensus of where we are tonight. That's correct. Um, we didn't just come out of the clear blue sky or, or you didn't come out of the clear blue sky. We were working on this for a good year. Two, two and a half. Two and a half years, okay. Um, I, just, just to state, state the obvious is um, we got a lot of input at these meetings, but I also got a lot of input at people's doorsteps over the last few months. And um, uh, I think Mr. Walker left turn road before you um, I went down in a couple cellars down there over the summer here, and the water was at least waste to almost uh, this type of highness. So um, it, was, it was destruction. A lot of folks had said this has never happened before. Previously, they lived there for 40, 50 years. It's never happened. So sometimes people outside of that area don't fully understand what the destruction became. They don't live in that particular area of the city, as we are a big city. And there's a lot of different issues in each particular section. Being a Ward 1 resident myself, living on Chickatawbit Road on the C Street side, a lot of my, my, my neighbors were in this flood situation. So um, taking the ride during this storm in, in March, um, 
going into the particular neighborhoods, walking um, the bridges and all these different particular areas, the dike. I got to see right on the site how this, how this destruction came about. So a lot of folks that don't live in this particular area that aren't affected by it, um, it, was, it was stuff you see on TV. It actually happened here in our city. So um, um, a lot of the help, obviously, right away from the mayor, from the governor, um, from other elected officials coming in and helping and walking Post Island, which I think, in my personal viewpoint, was the most destruction area, um, right particularly on the wall, um, just because of the wind and the velocity. Um, ju just, just to talk a little bit about, um, that's where we are. Um, if this was to be approved, and I, I wanna thank um, 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 the DPW commissioner and um, Paul Costello as well, um, I put, I put a, a resolve in back in November of this 2018 about the pumping station. Um, I walked the grounds with the willows over in the willows and the particular um, folks that live over there in that area. And they said the water had set a pool back there. And what happened was that it receded back up onto their property. Correct. So it came on the back end. Correct. It didn't come from the ocean side. It came in, the water, I guess, became a pool. I'm not an engineer in this area, but they said it receded in that way because it had nowhere else to go. It was trapped. It was trapped, if that's, if that's the terminology you need to use. And then that happened in other sections of C Street where we actually blocked the road right in the 600 range of C Street um, before you get to Post Island. The water had nowhere else to go. It ran up on the, onto the dike, um, which is unreal, to be honest with you. Um, so I know we're talking about the funding end of it, and here we are. My question to you guys is, is what kind of warranty do we have upon the completion of this? How, how long does it last for? Um, if there's any repairs, any type of uh, maintenance that needs to be done, can you talk a little bit about that part of it? Sure. Um, as a normal construction on a 3030M or 30B, uh, the, 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 the contract documents that we prepared for the contractor require him to have a, a warranty his work. Uh, and we will hold him accountable to that. Uh, certainly there'll be inspections to make sure that everything is done and approved. Uh, all the shop during procedure submittals that go on, uh, make sure that, that he is building what he, we have requested in the design documents. Uh, as far as his, his um, after he's completed and his substantial complete is gone, he's a, he has a warranty procedure he has to follow. How many years? Uh, usually it's one year um, for, for workmanship uh, and materials that are there. Um, we don't have any pumps associated with this, so there's no, there's no warranties associated with pumps here. Um, certainly the valves and some of those materials will have longer warranties. Um, as far as the design, the design is designed for 50-year life. Uh, 50, okay. the, uh, working in collaboration with many of the, the homeowners and with the engineering office, we've taken all the drainage structures. Uh, we've taken what was antiquated, you know, years old uh, pipe systems um, and done full analysis of every watershed and we've increased every single one of those pipes. Uh, some of them have doubled and tripled and even multiplied by five of uh, the size of those pipes in order to release that water out as fast as possible. Uh, and on each of the structures that discharge water through the wall or under the wall, uh, there's a one-way valve system so that no seawater can actually um, uh, come in those pipes. There's only a one-way release to go out. So um, we believe that the seawall structure itself, the infrastructure there and the pipes, um, you know, is a 50-year design life. Even with these built, there's still going to have to be some type of um, proactive approach of making sure the yacht fall pipes and, and catch bases are all, you know, not clogged up. Is, is that correct? Is correct. It, there's a the normal um, O and M procedure that the city DPW will need to follow uh, in order to maintain those those structures. Yes. Uh, Paul, do you want to speak to that? Yeah. Uh, the city has standard operating procedures for maintaining the catch basins. Um, <clears throat> Those procedures were actually submitted, <coughs> excuse me, instead of DEP and the EPA last year as part of the new MS4 permit. So those, those procedures are all in place. Um, obviously, you know, we're going to build this. Um, if it's approved, we're gonna, you, you guys are going to build this in that nine-month time frame for a year. Um, you know, the water, we know that the water, if it gets over this wall, it's got to get back out there. Um, do we, do we, is this going to, solve the issues that we have with the pumping station. Where would the pump, where would the water be going out of this Adam Shore stormwater pump station? Where's the water gonna go to if it's pumped? 
Uh, the first phase of the stormwater management planning is a hydraulic model to determine that. Okay. Um, like most nor'easters, uh, you have the high tide levels, but it's also accompanied by significant rainfall events. Uh, last year's storm had three inches of rain right at high tide. So the outfall pipes are all well below the tide levels, in some cases 10 feet. So when that rain comes down, um, it has to be handled. So the, the next phase of the work will be to do a hydraulic model. We'll be working with the Corps of Engineers. We'll try to maximize the Willows Marsh area storage as much as possible. There might be pumping involved. Uh, there might be earth and swales involved. There might be concrete pipes involved. Uh, but that analysis will come with a hydraulic model. So we'll model both the high tide event and what happens when you get a significant rainfall event on top of it. I obviously was out there and I saw a lot of cracks in the seawalls at different areas and that's where some of the water had moved, um, had found its way through that. Um, just a little bit about pre-construction. We're talking about a timeline on this being done. Now they're gonna have this built and they're gonna take it in prefabbed? Is that how it's gonna be done? Is this, is this prefabbed um, seawall? There's actually two components of the seawall. Uh, if I go back, the actual um, the leveling slab that will go on top of the, mm -hmm. the revetment is a cast in place. Uh, there okay. will be a, a yeah. helical anchors drilled yeah. through the revetment, tied into the leveling, leveling slab. Leveling slab will have rebar throughout it, and then rebar coming up through. Yep. The precast, cast off site, and then off delivered are right. the seawall units. And those will be delivered to the site and, and then tied in by rebar, fiberglass rebar, into the leveling slab itself. I know the folks had been debating on the height level, and um, no matter what, everybody's going to get two feet. Is, is that correct? Everybody's. That is our recommendation. That is the design okay. that's been permitted, yes. Um, do you have a, I guess you could call it terminology wise, is there a lever or is there a, a way of putting an extension on that to four feet or no, that this is what it's going to be at and there's no extension that you can add another two feet 10 years down the road, 15 great, years down. Great question. That has been the, the core of the design issue that's gone back and forth for some time now. The way we have uh, put it to bid and way we've designed it and permitted, it allows for the city to have flexibility. Okay. So the city can build the two foot additional height or and the four foot additional height. So if we only do two feet, we can come back in the future in 10 years, 20, 25 years and add another two feet. And that, that's important. That's important to know. So you have some type of hinge or some type of model that, that allows us to put that on without bringing in a new constructed four feet. Effectively, uh, as, as I'm showing on the laser, there's a, there's a two by two block that okay. will sit directly on top of the, the new right. precast block. Now, obviously, I talked to a few folks that live in particular areas of the seawall that have stairs that go down to the, the beach or, or the seawall sea extension. How, how is that going to be maintained throughout our wall from Chickatawba all the way down to Howe's Neck? I mean, there's going to be, do we have set areas where those staircases will be? Or are they going to move the particular staircases where the existing are? Or how do you... How do you kind of answer those? The existing private staircases have to be removed. Okay. Uh, they will no longer fit up and over the two foot high wall, so those have to be um, redesigned and rebuilt. Um, the city is not proposing to, to take that on at this time. However, in the design and the permitting, we design those for what they need to look like, okay. and we built those into the permits. Uh, so that so private homeowners can replace their seawalls, their stairwells if they want. The public access staircases have been designed to go up and over those walls, and obviously if it's a four foot wall, it's a separate design to go a little bit higher. These are all the questions that I received going door to door, different particular areas saying, well, I have a private one here, there's a public one over here, and that's, I'm just trying to get a consensus for all these folks, is we, we represent them, I want to know what they wanted, so it, I'm, I'm glad we're here to this day. I wish we could have approved this tonight, to be honest with you. Um, I mean, um, time is of the essence. Um, in case there is a storm coming up this uh, winter, what, what is it, the mitigation process that we're going to need to do? We're just, we're going to have to get the outfall pipes um, and, and the catch basins uh, cleared and just be on top of this. Um, the, department, the department has spent a, a tremendous amount of work cleaning out uh, each one of those outfalls along the entire seawall 
And if I'm not mistaken, if I can speak for Mr. Costello, we've seen incredible improvement during every storm event. We've had no backup in the systems, to my knowledge. That's what's been reported. Some of the emergency mitigation funding that we got back from MEMA or FEMA, um, if there's any existing new funding that comes back, can we put it towards this? Or, how, or does it pay down our, I guess you could call debt? Uh, there are two pots of money coming back from the storm. Okay. Um, the first one is, in the FEMA language, we call it permanent repairs that were done. Okay. Uh, that permanent repair money, uh, I believe, is being returned to the, the sewer and drain fund, if okay. I'm not mistaken. Um, that's, a, again, a city decision, but it's a, that's a smaller pot of money. The larger pot of money that we see, the second bullet up there is $5.2 million. Um, that's actually, if you cut that in half, $2.6 million is what FEMA recommended to replace the damaged seawall to its pre-storm condition. But if the sure. city sure. improves that, the city is eligible for FEMA monies multiplied by two. That's why the 2.6 went up to 5.2. So there's two pots of money. 5.2 is only one of them. If I get any more questions before our vote next time or whatever the case may be for many of these folks, I'm going to feel free to come back and revisit some more questions. But um, I, I think we're, we're, we're supposed to be here. I wish we had gotten to this vote before the summer break, but we're here today. And uh, I'm looking forward to more discussion and um, getting more input from the residents here. So. I want to thank you guys for coming in tonight and, and, and doing this, but um, uh, it's not over yet. So if there may be more questions and maybe more things that are going out there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. All right, we're going to recess and uh, go into regular council session, and we'll come back either uh, after we finish council or uh, in between. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Monday evening, September 16, 2019 meeting of the Quincy City Council. Madam Clerk, if you would please call the roll. Councilor Kane. Present. Councilor DeBona. Present. Councilor Harris. Present. Councilor Hughes. Councilor Liang. Present. Councilor Mahoney. Present. Council McCarthy. Council Pelmucci. Present. President Kroll. Present. Nine members, Nine we have a quorum. Members. At this point, if uh, my council colleagues in the audience wouldn't mind standing and joining me in a moment of silence, keeping in our thoughts and prayers those courageous men and women who defend our country. If you would kindly join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam Clerk, if you please would, read into the record the open meeting law. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Excellent. And with that, uh, the first item on the agenda is honoring of Quincy native Martin Bowes from the Major League Lacrosse. And I'd like to uh, recognize Council Mahoney. Council. Thank, Thank you very much. Um, it's it was. A great story to be told here about Martin Bowes. Um, I got a phone call from our former counselor up here, Joe Finn, and we were talking about Martin and um, how exciting it was that he's a Quincy resident that grew up here in Quincy and went on to play in Major League Lacrosse. But I want to back up just a little bit because Martin and I had a great conversation and I just wanted to share with um, the residents of Quincy um, our own Martin Bowes. So Martin was born on July 20th, 1990. He has a younger and older sister. And I knew his mom, Catherine, and his dad, Michael. And I know they're proud, proud parents of all three of their talented children. But Martin had a lot of energy as a young child, so he tells me. Um, and I know many parents at home can relate to this. When you have a child that has a lot of energy, you want them to burn that off. But he was obsessed at an early age with running around. He liked running on rocks, and he liked sports. And like many young children, he had dreams of playing professionally at something. Maybe basketball was his dream, until he was introduced to a sport that would lead him to his dreams. Mart was introduced to lacrosse when he was in sixth grade. 
the early days of Quincy Youth Lacrosse, and his first, his first coach, and these are Martin's words, was the godfather of lacrosse. That would be Joe Finn. <laughs> Um, Coach Finn stressed to him that young, to the, and to the other young lacrosse players to practice at home, to increase their stick skills, and Martin took this to heart. Um, I'm going to let Joe talk about that a little bit, but I'm going to go on just to, for a few more stats for Martin. So Martin is a graduate of Quincy, Quincy Public Schools. He graduated from Quincy High School in 2008. He was a leading scorer from his sophomore year to his senior year. He was named Eastern Mass All-Star. That, wasn't just, that, that just started where we were proud for Martin for leaving our Quincy Public Schools. But then he went on and he attended the University of Hartford, where he walked on and he became a, lacrosse, a varsity lacrosse player, Division I, and played all four years from 2008 to 2012. Martin was, again, the leading scorer. He played midfield in his junior and senior year, and he was named second team to the new, to second team all New England senior year. Martin was drafted in 2012. He was the eighth round, and he was picked 64th by the Boston Cannons, MLL. He's now living his dream. He is a professional lacrosse player. He spent one year in practice squad before dressing for his game in 2013, and he played for the Boston Cannons 2013 to 16, the Florida launch in 2017 to 18, and Boston Cannons 2019. Well, the most interesting part of this is now Quincy Cannons is right back here in the Veterans Stadium. And Quincy welcomed Martin back in the only way that we knew how. When the Boston Cannons debuted in the Quincy Veterans Memorial Stadium in their home game, the buzz was never more frenzied when the city's favorite son took the field. And this is right out of a newspaper article, Martin. Um, so from there, a sellout crowd of more than 5,000 fans took, um, were there to root on the 13-12 victory over the New York Lizards, but dozens were in attendance to watch Martin Bowes make a triumphant return to the hometown surf, turf. Screams of Marty filled the, <laughs> I worked on that, Marty, <laughs> filled the bleachers um, any time ball, the ball found his stick. Martin, unfortunately, was sidelined, unfortunately, with a head injury, but he's working, he's working with his medical team and hopes to return to the sport he does love. So at this time, Martin is helping other players at Complete Lacrosse Academy in Norwood, where they provide athletes with the opportunity to take athletic development into their own hands, with their ability to play and practice and train and teach with the top coaches, strategies, and, and the athletic programs, which will give them the opportunity to achieve their long-term goals. Those long-term goals started at Quincy Youth Lacrosse here with Joe Finn, and Martin is just trying to help other people to achieve those same goals. Another initiative that Martin holds close to his heart is the Sports Museum and the Boston Sports Community Standing Strong Against Bullying. Through videos and activities and award-winning educational programs, they leverage, leverage the power of the example that sports can help stop bullying in schools and in our communities. So Martin, it's with great privilege, privilege that we welcome you to the City Council to give you this, this accommodation award. But before we go on with that, I'd like to invite Joe Finn to the microphone to say a few words. Uh, thank you. And uh, I would like to thank Councillor Mahoney for giving me, in some respects, the opportunity to correct a mistake I made while I was still on the city council. We had actually in... Uh, uh, Just one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's about it. We're here uh, to forgive. But President Hughes remembers we actually had it scheduled to honor Martin, but a scheduling difficulty made it not possible. So thank you for that. I'd like to introduce someone else from Quincy who I'm incredibly proud of as well who was on my very first team that I had ever coached in lacrosse, Chris Baker. And the thing that I'm so proud about, Chris, he's a graduate of uh, w, uh, Worcester Polytechnical Institute, uh, currently is an engineer for the T, but actually took the time to come back and to give to other young people in the sport of lacrosse. And um, again, let me assure you that anything that I may have taught Martin Bowes about lacrosse is currently completely and totally outdated at this point. <laughs> uh, but I want to just recall something that uh, makes this day, what makes this day kind of important is that the University of Hartford made it into the first round of the NCAA playoffs. And they were playing Cornell, and they were playing in the Carrier Dome up in Syracuse. 
And uh, I remember because I had to run because the other game was running over and I had to get on a computer onto ESPN3 to get that game on so that I could watch it. And that game opened up, the very first thing was the first goal and they said, goal, the first goal is scored by Martin Bowes of Quincy, Massachusetts. And that just gave me such a sense of pride to think that this young person had achieved this incredible level of lacrosse. He scored that goal in his junior year. We won't talk about the rest of the game as it went on, but, but again, <laughs> uh, it was uh, fantastic. Um, but Martin also has given back in so many ways, and he gives back to Quincy Youth Lacrosse presently and to many others in terms of teaching the skills of lacrosse. And I'd like to invite Chris, who is the president of Quincy, uh, Youth, uh, Quincy Lacrosse, to maybe perhaps speak to a little bit to that. Thank you, Joe, the godfather of Quincy Youth Lacrosse. <laughs> um, as you said, uh, Marty has been a great um, advocate for lacrosse in Quincy. Uh, and I think he inspires some of the young kids, some of the local kids uh, that are learning to play the sport to see that a local kid can play professionally um, if they work hard. And that's one of the main things that Marty really preaches. I know. I think you started in sixth or seventh grade, a little later than kids typically start these days. And um, he really preached hard work and, and really uh, committing himself to, to his craft to get to that point. And uh, we really appreciate everything Marty's done for our program. He comes and helps out and meets with the kids and works with them after practice. And uh, he's been a great help for the, for the uh, development of lacrosse in Quincy. And I'd also like to thank the city of Quincy as well uh, for supporting lacrosse and the development and growth of the sport um, with the new turf fields and the cannons coming to town and our relationship with the parks department has been excellent. Uh, they really support and uh, communicate with us very well on whatever we need. Um, but more importantly, thank you very much to Marty Bowes and uh, congratulations for this honor. Thank you. I didn't know if I was gonna to have to speak at this, so here we go. Uh, thank you, Ann. That was fantastic. Thank you for the time and attention. Hi, Ian. Hey, <laughs> um, the most competitive rec kid I ever had. <laughs> well, thank you guys for uh, even giving this uh, a, a piece of attention. I really didn't know what to expect when I came here, uh, but nothing but you know really true gratitude, starting right here, the Godfather himself, that's going to be your new nickname. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Chris, thank that? you so much, man. Kevin, for all that you do. Mikey, even you, buddy. All right? <laughs> we appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I got, guys. Thank you so much, and uh, have a great rest of your Monday. <laughs>
First item on the agenda, please, Madam Clerk. 2019-087, an appropriation for capital improvement plan seawalls amendment in accordance with the bids. Council McCarthy. I know we're not going to, thank you, Mr. President. I know we won't have a vote tonight. Um, I assume just uh, protocol-wise it will go back. We'll go back into committee after we're done, and right. then we'll bring it back out uh, next so, meeting. I, I believe, and I defer to the chair, but there was a, uh, there was a uh, change in the bids after they right. came out. So actually, we're voting on the amended number so that it can be properly advertised. And when it comes back, it'll be you know so, presented for a vote. So I'll make a motion to um, to vote on that amended number. Okay, motion made by Councillor McCarthy on the number, second by the finance chair, Council Kane. Any discussion, Councillor Palmucci? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so I don't understand why we don't vote on this tonight. The issue is it was originally advertised at $14.3 million. If this is the kind of thing that's timely that the work needs to get done, we can approve $14.3 million and then an additional bond authorization for the difference between 14 and 17 million can come in. That can be re-advertised, but that 14 million would allow them to get started. If that's been advertised, we can lawfully vote on it this evening. So if, I mean, it's not projects that directly impact Ward 4, but I just throw that out there. I, I, I think that would be kosher if we did that. Right. Alternatively, just while well, they're kind of talking through procedurally, I think kind of the yeah. thought was too to figure out if hotel motel tax could be augmented to offset the overall bond, right? Oh, well, arguably, yeah. I mean, I have no dog in that fight, but it, arguably, right. it could still be done. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. I heard yeah. two councilors well, say I mean, they wish they could pass it tonight. I think there's a way to do it. I leave it to the discretion of the body if they want to pass it tonight in that form, but. You all set council, you're gonna yeah. no, 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 council yeah. Yep. I'm good. Uh, how much do we have in the hotel motel tax? Because if we're sorry, I just I wanted to ask you as you were leaving the room. Um, if we're only approving the fourteen and then depending on how much we have in the hotel motel, that might offset then the additional request, right, that we're putting in. Huh? Currently there's one point eight million or one point eight five eight million. And um, we've already covered our debt ob obligation for this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. Um, for fiscal year 20, um, and we have obviously not started receiving revenue when our first um, revenue payment will get posted the, um, the end of September. Okay, so I mean, even best case scenario, uh, if we were able to get 1.8 to offset the 17, we'd still have to come up with and approve another one or $2 million. So even if we move forward with the 14 today, and let's say, again, we get the $1.8 million in hotel motel tax, best case scenario that we can use towards this, you know, we'd still have to have an additional appropriation request. You see what I'm saying? Could, so, I, um, Could I just clarify one thing? I wouldn't recommend using the $1.8 million to, to cover the, this bond because that is the total amount of money that's in that particular fund. No, I'm, I'm just saying best sure case if scenario any, if we were to do that, right? So what I'm saying is that if we approved the 14 today, and we still have a question about whether or not any funds can come from hotel motel tax, that would just go off, if it's a yes, any amount in there would just go off to reducing the remaining balance. Correct, what you, what you would wanna do, and this is if the administration would wanna do it, you would wanna use a portion of the hotel motel to offset the yearly debt service um, bill each, each year. All right. Okay. So essentially what you could do is this turns into, so when we go back to committee, because that's where it's pending or lying right now, you could amend the bond to incorporate language that the hotel motel tax become a funding source. Correct, Madam Yes, Margaret? that's correct. Okay. Thank you. No, I was just wondering how much was in there, because again, if we went forward with the 14, mm -hmm. um, and any funding could come from hotel motel, and let's say that funding was like $10 million, right? Well, then maybe we don't want to approve the 14 because monies can come from elsewhere, but we don't have that much in there. So even if we approved the 14, and like I said, just best case scenario, all of the hotel motel funding could come to it, we would still need to have 14 right. plus some, right, to make up 17. Does that make sense, uh, what yeah. I'm trying to get at? So, like, You're nodding your head, Eric. So last you year we received... <laughs> In fiscal 19, the revenue we received in that goes into the open space account, because obviously what happens is the monies come in 
85% goes into an account for open space, which includes seawalls, and 15% goes into an account for tourism. Right, no, I'm so, not saying that we use all of it. I okay. was just trying to figure out how much we could use and how much was at our disposal if we were able to use any. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Mr. President. Thank you. Hold on one moment. You're all set, Council Yang? Yes, Counselor thank you. Devona. Um, just, just, just real quick, Mr. Mr. President. Uh, just real quick, Mr. President. If uh, the approval for um, hotel motel tax is only for seawall um, uh, seawall repairs, this this other funding is for pumping stations, hydraulic study. So I don't know if the criteria falls under that. Um, it does it probably does not? Okay. Right. Um, so. Um, if the recommendations from the auditor is is to is to is to kind of we, you know what it's the bodies to vote on it and, and figure it out if you want to go that route and I kind of put it in the hands of the ward one counselor but um, um time is of the essence for this and and obviously we know there's a timeline that needs to be done so uh, with that being said I just want to let everybody you know the, the body know what criteria it's under um, if any if Mr Walker had anything to say I don't know if he oh, okay. <laughs> But anyway, that, that's um, what it basically has. There's a motion, Council McCarthy, I'm going to go to you, but I also just kind of point out that that would, any modifications to funding sources would have to come from the administration. So we put it out there as kind of, hey, maybe this is something you can explore, but like we're not in a position, on my understanding, Madam Clark, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to basically say this will be the funding source. Right, we can advocate, but the implementation yep, right, comes right. out of the sure. corner office. Council McCarthy, just to back up a little, back up a little bit with um, Council Palmucci's suggestion. Um, I know early on, Councilor Hughes wanted to make the motion to approve it. Um, I'm, I'm all in full support to to go after it now and and get it approved, and then go back for that second appropriation. And uh, I'll you know, talk with the administration and we'll work with the administration on where that appropriation is gonna, gonna happen from. But um, unless uh, Mr. Walker or somebody wants to say that we, not a good idea to start now, I think to approve it now uh, would, be, would, be, would be the right move. I defer to Mr. Walker. So on that, we got a couple of things going on here. We just need to break this down real quick. So originally we came in, it was advertised for $14 million and change. This amendment that was put on the agenda was in recognition of the fact that the bids came in higher than was originally advertised, right? So we have that in front of us um, with an item for 14 and change pending in Councilor Kane's committee right now. The item before us says to amend the bond with the number now post uh, bid process. So I, essentially we could table it and revisit the 14 million when we, when we go back to, uh, Madam Clerk, I need you to back me up on the procedure here, but this is my thought. You could table this, which is the amended number, go back and revisit and uh, have that conversation in committee, which we will do after one, two, three, four, five more agenda items that'll be on the 14, which was the originally proposed number. So the reason that this item number one is in front of us is because there's a delta of what we thought was and what actually is. Just to complicate things a little more. And I would welcome you, Madam Clerk, as the parliamentarian to weigh in. Council Palmucci. I, I would just suggest respectfully that Councillor McCarthy withdraw the motion that he just made as only he can withdraw it because it was to approve the amendment and amended version and send that amended version into committee. If he withdraws that, then the only thing that's on the table for us, technically there's nothing on the in table, committee. but he can then. It's in committee. Right, he can then suggest that we pass or that the council pass the um, council order 2019-87 as was advertised, which was 14.22 But that 14 motion is made in committee. It doesn't have to be, he can make it item. right now. We're at a council meeting. He could, you can take well, anything you, out of you agenda. You can make a motion time. to cut. Right. You can make a motion to cut. Well, he can make a motion to pull that out right now. Yeah. No, it's under reports of committees, but I, I appreciate it, and we'll get there if that's the will of the body. But the item is pending. There's a pending discussion going on ensuing right now in committee, right? So either this item 
is something we're not going to act on. You withdraw your motion, and there's no action, and essentially it dies, and then we revisit the original number in committee. But you don't have to visit, revisit the original number in committee. He can move that it get, gets passed. The council agenda calls for a discussion of 2019-87. That's what he's doing. Although it speaks to an amendment, but we don't have to pass an amendment simply because the mayor puts it on an agenda. If Councilor saying, McCarthy wants to move it. The numbers are different. That's what I'm saying. It's the same council order number. If they brought in a different number, then it wouldn't be properly before the council. But the matter, 2019-87 is before the body right now. I mean, I, again, I don't have a dog in the fight, yeah, but if, right. we could no. pass it if we want to pass it right now at 14.32 million, or we could send it back to committee and do whatever we're gonna do and then bring it out later on in the night and pass it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to me. I'm probably just saying, the cleaner way to do it if that's the way of the body, but I would also wait, allow the parliamentarian to weigh in. Madam Clark. I will say that um, 2019, 087 was um, advertised on 51519, and so it is properly before us for the 14 plus million. And so, if you wanted to go that way, you do not have to accept the amendment that's before us now for the 17 million. Okay. Amend order total, right? And refer back to Finance Committee. So, basically, if you take no action on this, okay. there's no amendment. Right. That's what I'm trying to right. figure so out. So they didn't yet accept the amendment, so they could go to the original $14 million. So would you like to withdraw your motion? Go ahead, Councilman. If you want to do this cleaner, I'll withdraw my motion, well, and we'll bring it back out of committee at the I end of the night? That's cleaner. Is that nicer? I think that's like cleaner. That? Okay, then I withdraw the motion. Thank you. Okay. Next item on the agenda, please, Madam Clerk. Next item is number two, 2019-147 land easement for MBTA North Quincy Station Project. Council Harris. Uh, I make a motion to approve. Motion made by Council Harris, second by Councilor Calmucci. Council Yang, did you have something? I just wanted to know um, what this is for. I, I, I do see that some of the language in here is, is that um, it's in reference to construction. I imagine it has to do with um, the work that's being done on the station. I just want to confirm that that's the case. I'm not necessarily questioning anything Mr. we're Walker, doing. Through you. I'm very apprehensive about everything the MBTA does, so just want to make sure. Through you, Mr. President, that that is accurate, Councilor. Essentially, that there was a gas line on the site uh, due to the, the project that's going on there. Gas, a new gas line will be installed. This is the easement to allow for that gas line. Okay, and they're going to be responsible for all the work around this is there? Not, uh, this is not, to my knowledge, related to the MBTA uh, itself. This is to service the development that's happening on the site. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Motion made by Council Harris, second by uh, Council Palmucci. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Kane. Yes. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. Nine, Nine members. members. The item passes. Next item on the agenda, please, Madam Clerk. Next item is number three, 2019-148. Motion to accept the gift and send a thanks, please. Motion made by Council Kane to accept the gift, second by Council Palmucci. Discussion, seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. Nine members. Members, the gift is received. Next item on the agenda, please, Madam Clerk. Next item on the agenda is two. Motion made by Council Kane to weigh the reading Don't on the. Accept the gift and the motion made by Council Kane, second by Council DeBona. Any discussion? Yeah. <laughs> Council DeBona. Just, just real quick on this Monarchs Temple, uh, Masonic Temple Association. I, I attended the uh, rededication this past weekend, uh, weekend ago, with uh, Council McCarthy and the mayor and um, the chiefs. Um, and you know, just just to elaborate a little bit. They're, they're giving a gift of ten thousand um, dollars to the Quincy Police as well as the Quincy Fire um, for their work during the fire that happened a few years ago. Um, they obviously have just been displaced. Um, over in Weymouth, and then they came back just recently and took took a, 
uh, a property over on uh, Greenleaf Street. So um, it was great. It was a great ceremony. Um, it was it was definitely different, and it was really cool. But um, uh, there's two uh, gifts here for ten thousand each. But I'm going to Quincy Police and Quincy Fire for all their help that they did during that fire, and and they were right there um, with everyone. So. Um, that's their gift. Um, I thought it would be recognized um, for, for the public to understand and know, um, but that's where the gifts are going to. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Any further discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBarna. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Hughes. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. Nine members. Nine members. The gift is received. Next item on the agenda, please. Number five, 2019-150, gift for 10,000. Motion made by Councilor Kane to waive the reading on the motion. A motion to accept and please send a thank you note. Motion made, second by Councilor DeBona. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Hughes. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. Nine members. Nine members, the gift is received. Okay, that concludes the regularly scheduled uh, business of the meeting. Let's go with approval of meeting minutes from September 3rd, 2019. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. With that, I will take a recess. We'll go back into finance. Okay, welcome back to the Finance Committee meeting. We are um, we're going to talk a little bit more about the C walls and happy to entertain more questions or motion. Council Pramuchi. I will make a motion. Uh, to, I'll defer to my colleague in Ward One if he would like to make a motion. Yeah. Who, uh, make a motion um, to uh, take the amended amount um, for the uh, seawall. The original amount. No, the, the original amount, amount yep. excuse me. Um, the original amount and approve the amendment for the seawall project. No. 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 So just motion to approve. Just motion to approve. <laughs> motion to approve. Okay. Yeah. Motion to approve. Yeah. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Good. Uh, <laughs> any opposed? Ayes have it. Okay, now in the second part of our finance committee meeting, we are uh, discussing a uh, capital improvement appropriation for just over $10 million for uh, certain capital improvements, including the purchase of vehicles and equipment, technology upgrades, public facility repairs, and traffic improvements. This is a request that uh, spans multiple city departments, and um, the information is detailed within. There are members and department heads here tonight to answer any questions that the body might have, including Paul Hines, uh, Commissioner of Public Buildings. We have Police Chief Keenan in the back. We have Police Fire Chief Cadigan, members of the Fire Department in the back also. Deputy Chief Jackson from the Fire Department, Chris Cassani from TPAL, Ali Rule from TPAL, Brian Glavin from IT. We have uh, also Dave Murphy, the Commissioner of Natural Resources. Thank you all for being here. Um, first up, Brian Pelmucci. Thank you. Um, I just have a general question to our finance people, perhaps. Yes. Uh, so just looking at the CIP 2019 debt service, which thank you for giving us. I think another council thank you too. It's helpful to see that. Um, that is that contemplating approval of these, or is that not include these? Okay. And so my question for that is, if it contemplates approval of, I mean, I guess some of these are legitimate capital improvements. I think some of them aren't, but nevertheless, we do them as capital improvements. Like, I'm thinking specifically the, um, the police cruisers. Not that I have a problem with approving it, but that's different than, you know, asbestos removal, uh, you know, one-time expense. We know the life cycle of a police cruiser and that, you know, every couple of years we're going to have to yes. re-up on, on police cruisers. So I guess what I was wondering is do we – 
average out in any way the cost of the cruiser against the bond yes. in the natural life yes. of so the cruiser? Yes, what we do is we assign, uh, we have four asset classes, five year, 10 year, 15 and 20. 15 is really a really rare asset class, you don't see too much in it. So police cruisers in that debt model you see, those police cruisers are, fi are over five, are five year bonds. But asbestos removal is generally considered a 20 year, okay. which is the max bond, because think once you remove it, it doesn't come back. There's no really depreciation cost to right. it. Right. So, because uh, we'd be in trouble if we were doing a, a 20 year life cycle for cruisers and we're replacing the fleet within every five years. Yeah, I feel like, yeah, DOI would probably give right. uh, okay. our office a call pretty quick. That was literally my only question about that. Um, and then I think my, I had a question about the, um, the lockers. I hate to ruin your body count. <laughs> no, that's okay. I just want to make sure you didn't break a hip. We know you're, you're in your sixties now, Al. Uh, Is that an age joke? <laughs> it was, yeah. Um, I resemble that remark. Uh, can you speak to school? Yes. So, okay. Um, I noticed that uh, there were a couple of schools in here. But I was under the understanding that the school committee had discussed previously uh, that there were a number of schools that required uh, new lockers and that... There are a number of schools that need new lockers, certainly. Um, I unfortunately am not privy to what the discussion was at apparently the most recent uh, school committee meeting. Uh, I found out yesterday with a cons uh, conversation with Councillor Kane uh, about the CIP for the first time Atlantic being thrown in the mix. Uh, I have no doubt that Atlantic would need new lockers. It's the same generation as is Broad Meadows, and I know Broad Meadows needs new lockers. Um, Point Webster needs new lockers. Um, portions of that builder, building are older than um, Atlantic and Broad Meadows. Portions of it have been renovated and got new lockers. So there's a mix at Point Webster. Um, we got a, a price to replace 300 of them. The newer generation are repairable with new doors, new hardware, so we're doing a hybrid there. Um, quite frankly, I, I mean, I can get the pricing. There's a state contract that our vendor uses. The, the procurement is done. Um, there is no provision in this current CIP menu for Atlantic or Broad Meadows. I did not anticipate, uh, didn't anticipate it last spring when this menu was, was developed and brought to the council. Uh, it's certainly something we can do. We can get so it's a menu we can pick and choose. Is what you're suggesting? No, no, no. Oh, okay. All right, that's a that's um, a, a pricks fix, yes. as you will. So we it's can. A um, it's a yes, of, of course. You have yeah, the discretion right. to cut anything you'd like. Right. I'm just being uh, a wise guy. Um, I would have absolutely no problem, and I would welcome uh, getting together the inventory of what's needed in those other two buildings. I would include Broad Meadows at the time of Atlantic, uh, and quite likely we may do better than the state contract. If we have that volume, we could go to the street and bid it. Um, but it would, it would require additional funding, and I'd come back to you for that uh, when we get a better sense on what that cost would be in the inventory. And by inventory, I mean the number of lockers needed. Those buildings are old enough that I, I don't think there would really be an opportunity to, to repair existing ones. I think it would be a wholesale replacements. Okay, and I didn't mean to step on any other ward counselors' toes in, in terms of I just, someone had raised that issue with me. So yeah, I, would, I, I think we should, it makes sense to look at Again, capital improvement. Do them. Do all the ones that need to be done in all the schools. Agreed. Also helps with parity. But um, those are all my questions. I'll uh, I'll be voting in in favor of um, of these. Great. I think. Thank uh, you. The addition. Councilor Liang. All those things are very important. So. Did you already shut my microphone off? Yeah, you, you said you were you said you were done. Councilor yeah, Liang. Louder. Yeah. Come over this way. Councilor Liang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good evening, Paul. I just have a couple of questions. So I'm looking through. Um, as I always do when it comes to, you know, large expenses or budget uh, questions is, you know, what has been spent to date and where we are with those things. And so um, I, you know, I agree with my, my counselor to my right that, you know, these are needs that we need to spend across the whole city. I mean, from underneath the ground with infrastructure improvements to the streets themselves, to the buildings that sit on top of them, um, there's quite a bit of work that the city needs to have happen and that does, you know, require resources and particularly, um, you know, physical resources, right? We need people to do the work, to spend this money, to make these improvements across the city. And to that end, I was looking at what has been done so far with the uh, CIP funds that have been appropriated. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking for a couple of updates, if, if you could. So the first is with the um, capital outlay in buildings, particularly the North Quincy branch. I see here that there is work being proposed 
uh, with this funding request to um, specifically go towards North Quincy, but I know that we've also had um, emergency repairs needed over there as well as emergency asbestos removal over at the North Quincy branch. So where are we with that right now? Um, all of that is before us. None of it has yet been executed. Um, we right now, we, I don't know if everybody's aware, but we had a, uh, uh, all of a sudden leaks appeared in many locations of the North Quincy Thomas Crane Library. Uh, the first one to appear was the first one to cause enough damage that the plaster fell to the floor. Uh, regrettably, there's asbestos in that plaster, so we had a release. Um, concerns for the staff in the building and the public at large caused us to close the building um, for, you know, without, without warning. Uh, it's regrettable, but it needed to happen. We've since had a number of uh, tests executed, air tests, wipe tests, you know, the, the toys, the books, everything. And the building is healthy, it's clean, the air is clean. Uh, I have professionals that were brought in, a couple of, of nationally known and one world-renowned expert who is interpreting all of the <coughs> test results of, that we had performed uh, and um, in the draft form of a memo now to go to the Board of Trustees of the Library and to the Council at large. Um, so we have not yet done that work. Uh, there was, in the last CIP, uh, funding, there was a number of library specific projects approved, um, some of which was the new flooring at the North Quincy Library and a limited area of floor abatement. Uh, because of what's happened with the ceiling, the entire ceiling in that building has to come down. Uh, and that's in the basement, that's in the, the staff bathrooms, that's in the break rooms, and that's in that, the huge reading room with that coffer dam ceiling. Mm -hmm. It all needs to come down. It's going to cost a bloody fortune. Um, it's certainly not what was appropriated uh, for the North Quincy branch last time. Um, the CIP funding overall that was done last time, we have executed all, the, all of the projects. There's very little city CIP money left. There's no school CIP money left. It's all been expended. There's some public safety monies available. We are working in the firehouses as we speak, building shower rooms to decontaminate uh, the, the firefighters in coordination with the extractors and the, and the turnout care that you folks had funded. So there is a pool of money that was designated for library projects that has not yet been tapped. I'm going to be tapping that now to get this emergency work done at the North Quincy Library. Um, we're gonna abate the entire, we're close to building down once, we're gonna do it all. We're gonna abate the entire ceiling, we're gonna abate the entire floor. Before that even happens though, we have to have the hazmat people in just because of ordinary dust and dice, dust and mites. Those books have sat, many of them for a long time, untouched. And if you take all those books out like needs to happen, you're displacing all of that. You're causing a health issue just with dust mites and regular dust. So they're gonna come in, they're gonna do the HEPA vacuuming, clean all the books, clean all the surfaces, clean all the tables, and then all of that will be moved out. I don't wanna do that twice with the floors later and the ceilings now, which mm -hmm. it makes all the sense in the world to do it once because it's gonna be a costly endeavor. So, um, yes, we're gonna have emergency abatement. We, we have what's planned flooring replacements just sooner than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. The roof we had, uh, when we first were developing the leaks last spring is when that was added to this menu. Unfortunately, we didn't get to it. Uh, we're getting to it now. Uh, my department's somewhat uniquely positioned right now that we went out to the street and I have a list of about eight or nine on-call designers under contract. So the designer selection law requirements have been met and I can pick up the phone and pick which of those firms is most aligned with the work that needs to be done for a particular project. And we have a build, a, one of those designers now called Building Envelope Specialists. Mm -hmm. They are working as we speak to do the specifications and the plans for the replacement of the roof at the North Quincy Library in the clear story windows that are incorporated into it. Um, I, I wish we could do it in a more expeditious manner, but the design is the design. The other aspect of what we've done with the department is we went out to the street and we have on call a number of trades. We have mechanical contractors, plumbers, electricians, tile workers, carpenters, and we also have roofers. So my procurement is done as far as going to bid to get the roof replaced once okay. we get the specifications. Well, so to that end, and sorry to interrupt, but just, um, that's, that's, you know, a big part of my question, right, tonight is that you, it's a capacity issue, right? Again, the funding is there and if in, if and when it is available, we want to make sure that the work gets done expeditiously and, and properly, right? And 
again, similar like I was doing with DPW earlier, um, just trying to figure out capacity with getting the seawalls done in an expeditious manner. I'm not trying to question you know, the capacity and, and the ability of the people in your department. I'm just trying to make sure you guys have the resources to get this work done, right? Because I look in front of me at the appropriation for this phase and um, you know, three fourths of it without counting is in public buildings, right? In the high schools, the library. Um, and it even says all buildings, right? And so I just wanna make sure again, it, if and when this funding is approved, um, you had mentioned that you do have some contractors who are gonna be on the ground doing the work here um, to spend down this money and to make these improvements. So are, is that the plan for these other projects in public buildings as well? Yes. Like I said, we've got a, a full uh, complement of contractors under contract as we speak. I can hand them a document and say, get going. Procurement is done. Uh, and that's quite frankly one of the more cumbersome and more difficult things to get anything going is the procurement process. And I understand the need and the wisdom for it, but it does slow you down at times. Yeah, no, but of course. I mean, you want to find the right people. You know, I just want to make sure also that we're not um, straining the folks that you do have in your department to you know, manage the city on a daily basis of things that come up on a daily basis and serving the residents and then also get pulled in this direction of now having to take on these projects as well. So I'm happy to hear that we have contractors. I'm happy to hear we're using local folks um, to do the work. And it sounds like you've planned out for, um, you know, the extra burden of the work that is going to come into your department. So I appreciate that. Um, I don't know that you could actually answer this question. And I don't know if Chris, there you are. I have a question on the, the TPAL work, if you don't mind. Thank you, Paul. I just, uh, again, looking back at what was spent in the past and, and sort of any funds that are still remaining and seeing where we are with the work, um, it says here from, I think this was phase two, that we still have some funding for the traffic improvement study. So I just want to see where we are on the master plan and then um, the funds that were spent, what were they spent on? So the uh, $2.3 million appropriation, the report was delivered to this body in, I believe, late May, early June. Mm -hmm. um, so we were actually kind of came in a little bit under budget there. We're in the process of processing a DDAC change order that'll give us roughly about 150,000 more dollars. There's only, um, you know, I believe about 30 to 50 thousand dollars that's unencumbered in that. Uh, our intention would be to um, spend those funds that remain on the 2.3 million on some detection upgrades, which is more or less what we've been doing since we started on this process, as well as some uh, ADA accessible ramp upgrades to fulfill some of the projects that have come up. Um, over the last few years, over the last year. All of the curb work that you've been doing up and down Hancock Street, is that coming out of this fund where you no, guys are redoing the DPW. ramps to make them more compliant or? That was part of the DPW project. Not this one? Correct. Okay. All right, well this isn't going to, is, that, is this gonna overlap with any of that work then with any of the curbing? No, no, any of the, uh, anything that, that my department is doing specifically would have been related purely to introducing sort of a new pedestrian, protected protect, pedestrian crossing in a location. Gotcha, okay. Um, and then I think that was it for you. I just have one last question. I'm not sure. Paul, this might actually be right back to Chris. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I just, I do need to go this evening. Allie Rule is here. If she has any questions, I have a childcare situation at home. So if anyone needs any questions from me, certainly follow up. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, the last question I have is just pertaining to the dog park. Um, I just wanted to see if we can get an update on where we are with that. I'm again, looking in the previous, um, CIP orders that have been in front of us and looking at the line item associated directly with the dog park, there are still, I know that some money of this has been spent down, but there was a revised budget for it from the original appropriation. There's still some funding left. So I just wanted to see if we can get an update and see where we are with that right now. I think about a million dollars has been spent and encumbered to date. Yes. Um, the monies that have been expended to date and the efforts that have been expended to date uh, relate to the construction of the road, the realignment of the road. There's a shifting of the uh, intersection with Quarry Street uh, at the suggestion at the request of the city's traffic engineer to improve sight lines. Uh, and there's geotech going on the proposed location for the structure um, to anticipate what needs to be done to stabilize the earth under the proposed building. Uh, and that will inform what the ultimate shape of the building is. We do have the conceptual designs, both floor plan and uh, elevations. Um, but it, was, um, it obviously needs to be um, designed around what soils can be supportive of it and what needs, what efforts need to be taken to support additional forward, uh, footings and um, soils to make the footprint for the foundation for the building. 
Okay, and uh, I know the council to my right, it's, it being in his word, I know he's been on top of this as well, so I will defer to him with any questions on this. Back to you on it, but um, I do want to, though also just get an idea of timeline then, because I know that this is something that has been weighing heavily on, obviously on, on Councilor Pamucci's mind, but all of ours as well, with residents wondering what, what is going on with this, you know? And, and you said you're doing um, the geotech on location right now to figure out where the structure of the building can go. And I know um, with any additional funding, it will come back in front of us, but what's the anticipated timeline for all of this work? And when can we see um, something come before us again? Okay. This, uh, the project and the funding for it kind of spans a couple of departments. The building piece is mine. The road work is parks. Um, I wish um, Dave Murphy was still here, Dave from Ty and Bond, because they're coordinating that effort as well. But I believe they've, they've fully designed the uh, upgrade of the road and it is going to bid, um, if it's not already out to bid, for the road construction. Uh, and that went tandem with the park, because the road gets to the park and then gets the trucks to build the building. So that had to be advanced first, so that's underway. Mm -hmm. um, the building, I don't have a set timeline at this point. Um, is the building of the building itself um, dependent on the construction of the road? That, does that have to happen first, or can this all happen simultaneously? The road needs to happen for the building, yes. The agreements are in place for Avalon to allow the temporary use and access to build the road, but not to build the building. So, so the road has to get done completely done 100% first before any, anything gets done on the building? It will be, it will be constructed and bind a course final pavement will not be on it until the trucks from the construction of the building are done, mm -hmm. then the final coat will go on to the final coat of pavement. Okay, do you have an estimated timeline for when the road is going to get started or how long it will take to build? Again, I know, I get that's not your department, yeah, but I mean, if the two departments the are working together, then I imagine you guys are talking at least to one another about sort of, you know, what comes first and what has to happen next, and then you're building your timeline based off what has to happen there. Yeah, I, again, my understanding is it's, it's on the street now for bidding. So construction would be imminent. I believe it's this fall's construction season for that. I don't know if Mr. Walker has more information on it than that. Okay, so my understanding is this fall is the construction season for the road. Uh, again, it, it won't be final finishes until the building is done so as not to, not to damage the final finishes of the road. Okay, and then how long do you anticipate then the building is gonna take, the building itself? It's not a large structure, no complicated. I, I, my understanding of the, um, the timeline for the construction, once the shovel goes in the ground, of it is 12 months. 12 weeks for the entire, oh, 12 months. Yes. Like, are you doing a prefab and dropping it in? So 12 months for the construction of the building? And you're doing 12, you're thinking you're gonna do 12 months straight through? I'm sorry? You think you're gonna do 12 months straight through without any stopping time? Yeah, the, it, it, that won't be weather impacted. They'll coordinate um, the construction cycle. It'll be extended out. Okay. And you still have to come in, correct me if I'm wrong, but you still have to come back in front of the council before correct. any of this gets done, correct? So correct. when the geotesting gets done, is that when you anticipate you'd come back in front of us? The first time they came in, they had requested $7 million and, and basically had conceptual drawings and the council pushed back and I understand why. That's my dog. Huh? That's my dog. <laughs> so, no, not at all. So the council uh, kind of split the baby and gave half the funding to advance the design, advance the, the drawings, um, so the council would be better informed of what they're actually voting for. Um, so this geotech piece is what's going to inform the first step of that. Um, and, and that report is in, we have those, those reports now. Uh, the Italian bond has done the interpretation of it. They've made uh, three recommendations on how best to stabilize the soils to support the building. Uh, and we're, we're mulling through that now. And then we can, uh, we can choose the method to support the soils and that'll inform what we use for a foundation system, um, both as to uh, strength, integrity, layout, and then the layout obviously dictates what we can do for building. Okay, and again, before any of that happens, though, you guys do have to come back in front of us with the final plan of what it looks like and, and the final cost, correct? Right, it can't go under contract until there's funding, and there is no funding until we come back here. Correct. Right, and, and again, just from looking at what was provided to us, which is there, and I appreciate it, from the schedule of, um, of the money to be spent. I don't see anything in here for the dog park. I just want to confirm that none of the funds in front of us tonight, if approved, is going to go towards the dog park. That anything additional that needs to be spent will come in front of us before anything moves forward, correct? correct. There's okay. nothing here for dog park, nor would it be shifted over for it. Thank there's, you. I just there's wanted... enough funding in place to get the project where you wanted to see it mm -hmm. before you finally fund it. There's no, there's no supplemental funding request for that. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for the update. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, motion to approve. On the motion, Councillor uh, Mahoney. It was me. Okay, I didn't hear. I couldn't hear you. Is it? It's for me, Ian. You are Councillor okay, Mahoney. I, I didn't still, hear right? you. I'm sorry. I was, you were looking at you were looking at Noel. It's been. It's 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 not the first time that people have mistaken <laughs> me. Um, so. Not for Noel, for usually Mr. McCarthy. Mr. McCarthy and me are interchangeable. So just, just when we're going through this and I'm looking at it, I know that you were saying vehicles are five years. So um, just for grouping purposes, I'm just curious. You know, you have multiple, the police and TPAL has some, I think TPAL has some, some vehicle, bucket yeah, truck. bucket truck. Yeah. That's a different lifespan though. Okay. So it would be helpful for me. I mean, you know, this is, this is, I think this is my first CAP. I could be wrong. This might, might not be my first. But when looking at this and looking at the equipment, an inventory of equipment is usually helpful, too, to kind of know, like, what your 10 cruisers are coming off, the life expectancy of certain things. And then also, is this TPAL's first bucket truck, second bucket truck? I'm not sure of those things. It would be helpful to know. Um, it would look, look like when I was going through the package of information, it was for specific lighting needs for LED lighting and, um, and those types of things. Do they not have a bucket truck, or is it... Uh, they currently have a bucket truck that's uh, reached its depreciable, its depreciable lifespan. It has already. So uh, when did they get that bucket truck? Isn't the department only three years old? <laughs> yeah, but we've been repairing traffic lights for longer. The organization. Oh, no, I know that. There. I know. So, I, I know. Uh, we've used that bucket truck. I think it's, if I remember correctly, it's a 1998 okay. model. So, it's an old F550 build. So will this be replacing that bucket truck? And then what do yes, we do with the bucket truck that we're replacing? Does that get sold um, or is it... It, it may become some that's used for parts later. Um, I mean, it's an F550 frame, so we run a lot of vehicles off that chassis structure. You what? We run a lot of vehicles off that chassis structure, an F550 frame. That's all the snow fighters, everything like that. Okay. So, I was just curious because when you're when something like this has come before us, it's not telling us that this is a replacement. It just says, you know, it, or it might say replacement, but you're not saying what you're doing with the current inventory. I know in the schools when they do the the buses, they do a they they kind of give an inventory of what the inventory of buses are what the longevity of the buses are, what the anticipation is, and, and when they're going to rotate them off. And then also when we're looking at the public buildings, again, I'll, I'll say the same thing. So this was approved, and I'm not sure um, if, if you could, Mr. Hines can answer this question. So these are all of the, the improvements in the Quincy Public Schools, when I'm looking at these, that were approved by the school committee, is that what you're saying? Or recommended by the school committee from, the, when you said that you didn't realize that the lockers were, that some of the lockers were not on the list or? When this menu was put together was, was last spring, or right. probably more like last February and then brought into the spring. My understanding. This comes out of the, the individual schools when they have their, like their wish list that they, they want to try to get accomplished or who makes these recommendations? I know as in the school committee, I'm just, I'm just trying to. Okay. The, each school on the website, as you know, from being on the school committee has mm -hmm. a, uh, the, the school improvement plan right. yep. and on page 10 of them, I pull them mm -hmm. and they list their, their wants, their wishes. Yeah. Um, there's also conversation with the superintendent of schools and many times, especially the lockers at Point Webster, I get the phone calls directly from the principals. Okay. Uh, and you know, some of it is like the boilers at Quincy high school, Dave Scott and Tony Maldero folks in my department say, Paul, the boilers have failed. They need to be replaced. They need to be replaced. Um, right. the, the school doesn't really have a say in that. They either, no. we, we either don't heat the building or we put in new boilers. Um, many times, honestly, some of the stuff as I walk around and I see things that need to be done, like the projects we did last summer, pulling all the asbestos tiles off the floors in Wallace and in Parker schools. I walked in and I saw the tile like this has to go. Yeah, so I, I, I think that's the reason Harry why. We do have reports that recommend it. But. That's the reason why I'm bringing that up because it, at some point, you know, when the, the school improvement plans, when the principals are before you, I mean, they would, they, they would sometimes be shy to ask for certain things because they just wanted maybe their windows not to leak and they'd be thrilled with that, but they would never think that they could actually put the lockers on there because, you know, their, their budgets are usually pretty tight for that. And, um, I, and, and I understand that you pull those reports from the school committee and the, the curious that I have is that, you know, do we do an inventory of when you're, when you're coming before us and you have those lockers or any of the other things that we have? Are we looking at like all of the schools to just check to, to see what the longevity of certain things are so that we know when we can put a schedule together or like in this particular case, yes, the lockers are a big deal because um, we even got calls from school committee members asking us about that. But I guess my curiosity is, is, is if you're getting those calls when you're putting these together, why would you not try to, you know, 
do those in a bunch, in a bundle, um, in that case. And is this when, and, and when this is approved, when will this work be done? That's the other question I had. And when you say, when we get the calls put together as a bundle, are you referring to the lockers? Well, you're saying, what you're saying is you get them out of the school improvement plans. And I'm wondering when you're going around and, and, and looking at schools, you said you recognized a couple of the schools that probably should also have the lockers replaced. Why? Yeah, that, you may have misunderstood or I may, may misspoke. I was not aware there was a request by Atlantic. I observed Broadmeadows, but in the hierarchy of pecking order of need. No, I understand. I understand. It, it, it wasn't no. high on the list, so, as high on the list. So you recognize that Broadmeadows is not on the list, right? Broadmeadows is not on the list. So you're saying it could. Not at this time. It, it does need them. Yeah. So you do have you do have those other schools that potentially need to have those things done. Yes. I just was wondering, like when you're buying lockers, if it, you buy them in bulk, I would think that you would get a better better deal. So we, of that situation and potentially put, be putting them in. That's what I was making reference to earlier today. The the state put out a contract, mm -hmm. uh, and one is for locker repairs, and others for locker replacements. We can mm -hmm. buy off that list. So that was competitively bid, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, on that particular one, it doesn't matter how many you get. Okay. But I made reference earlier to about Atlantic and Broad Meadows. There's enough in those two buildings that we may better be better off price-wise if we don't go off the state list. If we do bundle them and we go to the street on our own right. and see how we do with that volume of lockers versus what would be on the state contract list. Okay. Well, this is one of those concerns that I have because we have a lot of buildings that we take care of in the city of Quincy and, you know, taking it from the um, the the, um, the the meetings that are happening with the the principals and not actually understanding the full inventory of what we have and needs because sometimes they're not going to be some some schools ask for more than other schools do so making sure that there's an equitable um, equitable distribution across all of those schools to make sure it's fair and equitable as to what we're doing and then um, so when are the, the work when when will the work for these in these particular cases like locker repairs and, and replacements when do you anticipate those types of things happening if the, if the money is approved if the, the vendor on the locker of the state contract list is ready to go, I could call them tomorrow and say, put the order in, here's your purchase order. So you'd be doing it during school hours, during vacations? They could. Or? They, they've, they've got the staff that have the federal fingerprint requirement and the quarry clearances uh, in conversation with Christine Barrett, particularly at Point Webster, uh, about uh, having swing lockers that anyone whose lockers are getting taken out, these are what they're using for the day as a replacement. Um, and so it's anticipated it can happen during the day. Um, I'm going to see if they'll work third shift mm -hmm. just to minimize the impact on the educational environment. Um, but it's not major construction. These things are, are somewhat modular. So you just connect them from the wall, they come out and they go out the door. Um, the lead time for the lockers, if we call them tomorrow, is six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. no, that's putting us in basically to the first of the year, December vacations. Hopefully we can get a lot of it done during the Christmas break. Um, that would, that would be the best case scenario, obviously. And if we wanted to, we could kick the other. If we don't finish point at Christmas break, we could kick it off to February. So that's the, the lockers, but some of the other work that you're talking about, when do you, when, just out of curiosity, when do you, because the balance of timing, and this goes back to being able to manage all the projects, including the dog park and all the other things that we haven't seen back before the council. Um, and we are anticipating that, we, that that will come back before the council. But when you're talking about all the schools and all of the, the building work that's being done, is it scheduled you know, in different portions of different times or like when do you anticipate those things being done, roofs and things? Is that summer work for next summer or? Well, some of it is like an ongoing process. Like North Quincy High School is a very large building, has a lot of lights, has a lot of ceilings. If we get that under contract and roll with it, you know, vacations and summers, it, that's, that's far more than this cost here by the time we get to the end of that. Um, like the bathrooms, we did the snug harbor bathrooms, we did them over the summer. You know, handicap upgrades, new plumbing, even new pipes because it was so rotted because they, um, with the age of the building. So there's some things that you just cannot do till the summer, mm -hmm. but you need to have the funding in place to get under contract to do. Uh, and it's one of the problems of coming in in the springtime with the CIP is sometimes you don't have time to get under contract and procured and executed beginning June 30th when school walks out. Um, you're into July, you're into August, and, and that makes it exceedingly difficult. Um, I will say as far as our ability to execute, the last tranche of CIP money that public buildings got ended up being about $9 million in, in that, that, that area. Um, with the exception of the library, which I've described, um, 
we, we've we're performed. We did a, a, a very large volume of work in a short period of time, and we blew through those funds and, and got a lot of projects done. Um, maybe. I don't like the idea of blowing through funds, but I know what you're saying. So yeah, yeah. Anytime you say that with public money, it's blew through the work. Yeah, blew through the work, not the funds. The funds. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, you came under under budget. That would be. Um, so I, I guess when I'm looking at that, that that's among my concerns is that there, there's the things that we're doing, and I just want to make sure that we're we're looking at them holistically and not just because they're coming off of the um, off of the page ten of the principal's reports, because there's so much more that goes on in those buildings that need to be looked at. I mean, obviously the the boilers, like you said at, at Quincy High School, those are about are they how old are those now that they're the Quincy High? Yeah, ten years old. They're ten years old. Yeah, so so yep. in some ways they've lasted longer. They're they're they're. The newer, high efficiency ones really aren't equipment; they're appliances, mm -hmm. and they're kind of at their lifespan, which really is amazing to me. Um, but one of the other things too on on what populates the CIP, like we'll get a call, like the principal Renee at uh, at Montclair, she's got leaks in a couple of classrooms. Mm -hmm. We go in, we see them, we we make the physical and the the aesthetic repairs in the classroom before the start of school. Right. But you have to investigate where's the water coming from. No, those are the ones that, I mean, when the, I mean, that's what I'm saying. The principal is more likely to call because they have leaky, when, like a leaky roof that's causing, you know, um, problems in the classroom. But the lockers, they may not mention to you because right. they're, they're more of a luxury, even though, you know, the kids can't open them. And, they, and there's, a, there's, a time, there's a time that they need to be looked at. That's right. why... I well, think we have to look at them holistically across the board. Right. Whereas going with the Montclair one, though, is they call because they have a water damage in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Then I go in and look at it and say, well, where's the water coming from? Why is the water in the classroom? And you go outside and pointing. The brick is falling off the yeah, parapet. Yeah, pointing. Over the, so yeah. we get pointing. Yeah. Um, so that... Which is a regular maintenance. That should be yeah, you yeah. paint it or you fix it. But, no, you know. no, I know. You, you don't want to fix it. You don't fix the paint. You fix the, you fix the point first. Um, all right. Thank you very much. I thank do you. have a question, though, for um, information technology as well. Um, just out of curiosity for um, the two pieces there. Is that also something that's along? We have tape and archive solutions and then also um, visualiz visualization. Is that, something that's, is that something that is over 5, 10, 15, 20 years? That doesn't seem like first. That's, and then if we could explain what it is. Uh, yeah, so those are expensed over uh, 10 years. You're speaking IT is about a 10 year experience. 10 years, okay. And then could you just touch upon, you know, um, what is the, what, what are we investing in here for, if I, I'm looking for the department head to, to, yep. What's that? Just, just if you could in, in, just expand upon what the, what it is that we're investing for the information technology lines that you're asking for. Um, it's all around virtual environments, so getting rid of all the desktops and going virtual, okay. which will allow us to like, save energy and recover quicker. Okay. So we both of them, so the tape and archive solutions and the virtualization di di digital equipment, that's, they're, both, they're both related to the same thing? Yep. Okay. And is that for all employees? And, yes. Okay. Uh, well, there'll be certain departments that probably won't go virtual. They'll have to keep their desktops. Okay. Just based on their job functions. So will all of the employees then have desktop, um, portable, I mean laptops, or, or do they all have those now, or are they? Yeah, everyone has a, either desktop or a laptop right now. Okay, so they'll be able to be mobile and be able to work wherever necessary. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's all. That's just a quick question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just just looking over this punch list of the 41 items for the for the 10.3 million dollars. I mean, uh, looking at the police of the 10 cruisers and the TPAL and the information technology, um, some stuff to fire and parks and um, public buildings here. There's a there's a good punchline here. Just to get back on a little bit on Mr. Hines, um, real quick, is um, on these on these are these and I, I couldn't hear because my colleague was going back and forth and it's hard to keep track, but. Um, um, these punch light items, are they the top priority that needs to be done in these schools? At this point, I would say yes. Um, the need is great, not just in schools, but across all public buildings. Sure. Um, but these are on the higher end, yes. Okay. And, and there are some that have risen since this was presented to sure. you, and they'll be the subject of the next, next asks. I mean, a lot of the stuff that was spoken about tonight with lockers, and I see asbestos abatements in here. So at, at Snug Harbor and other other public buildings, I mean, this is um, these are serious items that are on this punch list that needs to be done, um, and we keep on pushing it down a little bit. So, um, just looking at this, does any of this 
fall under the criteria of the MSBA for reimbursement? It does not. Does not, and that's why it's on this this correct this the, list. The MSBA, like for boiler rooms, like the Quincy High component, um, for a long time their threshold was a 20-year age of a product to be replaced. Because of the popularity and other people have caught on to the MSBA accelerated repair program, they've had to put that out to 30 years now. So like the Point Webster windows, Broad Meadows and Atlantic, we're hoping to get in because they now are 20 years. They got to wait 10 more years if we're going to participate in the accelerated repair. Um, so regrettably, we, we can't get uh, assistance for the boilers at the school. I fully understand. You know, we're, we're obviously building the new schools. Um, we're, we're going to be going in the statement of interest and going into, uh, obviously, um, Squanum. But you know, we have to maintain the maintenance part of the punchlines for these other schools and the other, you know, um, 15, 16 schools that aren't brand new. And, and I know you've come in here in the past, Paul, and um, other, other issues that have to be done on the, on the punch list. But... Um, th this is a well-needed um, appropriation of funding for all these different departments. Um, I know that we've talked in the past with Chief uh, Keenan about the police cruisers and how we basically have to rotate them based on how much mileage and how much longevity they have, and we're moving these vehicles consistently. Um, but I've spoken to a few police officers about certain vehicles are at their at their last last I guess couple months left on to be used. I mean so. Um, I see some other things that are very important in here from the fire department as well. So, I mean, um, I see also in the schools there's a large bus and two mini buses. So, I mean, we look down the punchline of the different items and um, this being part of the five-year capital improvement plan, um, I mean, all the items look like they're much needed. So, um, I look like I'm in support of, of, of these appropriations. So I just, I'm glad that um, you gave us a nice list and that we could see an appropriations of funding. Um, do you foresee you coming back for more CIP uh, funding for other schools and public buildings? Absolutely. Um, for instance, the paving, there's a million dollar line here for paving. With the part of the funding we've received last time around, I had a survey done of all the firehouses and schools and the, pay, the immediate paving needs in just those facilities was $6 million. Did about 750,000 this past year. Um, this million dollars is the next round. But it, it, kind of to the phasing in our ability to execute, I didn't ask for the $5 million because I can't do $5 million of paving, especially with the schools because you're, you're in July and August and some of the schools have summer programs and stuff. So this is a, uh, a measured request to get a defined amount of work done, but there would be further steps to complete that project. The asbestos abatement, we're on an affirmative obligation to remove some of the particular asbestos in the schools. I will say, with the assistance of the Accelerator Repair Program and the MSBA, and certainly the Council's funding and the Mayor's uh, recommendation for appropriations, each time there's a boiler project done, those boiler rooms are completely abated of every stitch of asbestos in the room. Ceilings, wiring, devices, everything. So that has done a remarkable job at removing some of the asbestos in the schools that are called out in our reports. The schools are inspected every three years and we have to keep up with it and keep up with the removals. So that's another line here. What you see for a request for asbestos is not to be all end all. This is just one step. That is going to be a multiple year, multiple millions of dollars sure. endeavor. You remind me a little bit, Paul, of, of around the Atherton House School um, around the Wallison School, um, around the road going into Marymount. I've seen some good punchlines of a lot of work being done, um, infrastructure works, roads, sidewalks, around us, and, and, and traffic lights um, that are helping out the school zones, which are very important. I know those were a punchline, but you, you had to get them almost done before school started, so it, it was tough. So I, I fully understand being out there and, and examining all the different schools, but thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Council McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Hines. Um, Paul, I just want to say thanks for uh, the hard work. I know you and I talk a lot, um, public buildings, but um, especially uh, I know we toured uh, some of the Ward 1 schools, and the one that jumps out at me is Athen and Howe. Uh, you know, we know that the bathrooms at Athen and Howe were antiquated, and um, I'm glad they're on the list. Uh, I know we talked about flooring. It looks like you're going to take care of flooring in a lot of places in a lot of the schools. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but that it's it's all good stuff. Uh, same with TPAL, parks, public safety, all necessary items I think on here that uh, keep everything moving forward. Uh, but I appreciate this is quite a list on top of other things that you're doing in buildings and um, appreciate all the hard work. I had one quick question though that isn't here, the Adam Shaw Library. Just a quick update on, on the ongoings there. Sure. Um, the good news is we had that building tested and the asbestos is gone. The only asbestos is a little bit of floor tile and everything in the boiler room. We've done a complete gut job of that boiler room, entire replacement of the HVAC system. Boilers, air handlers, duct work, pumps, you name it. The room was completely gutted. Um, more extensive of a project than we anticipated, but when the engineers get in there and started doing the actual survey for the more measured project, um, they, they, they were amazed at the fact the system was still running um, with the age of it and the lack of maintenance through the years. Um, and the, the equipment that was anticipated to go in would have blocked the other equipment, so we wouldn't have been able to get to the other equipment, the air handlers and stuff from the air conditioning components, the boilers and stuff would block them. Um, it made no sense. You would never be able to do the AC unless you ripped out the new boilers. So we went in, we spoke with Megan Allen. She uh, had conversations with the Board of Trustees of the library, and we decided to do a wholesale replacement uh, of all the components. Um, we had some temporary air conditioning units that got pulled out of Quincy High School, and that was uh, demolished. And we were able to air condition the Adam Shore Library for this summer um, to a better condition than it's been air conditioned the last several years, I think almost 10 years. Um, so the temporary uh, fix was better than the, uh, the longstanding uh, reality. So um, that project is very near to complete 100%. Uh, they're at punch list status now on that. Um, and they will, uh, they'll find a, a great improvement in the quality of that building, particularly the ventilation aspect of it. Good, thank you very much, thank you. Okay, there is a motion on the floor to approve uh, all those in. Councilor Kroll. Thank you. Uh, hi, Ms. Tynes. Good evening. How are you? Good evening. Well, a um, couple of things I was just sort of thinking about, and I missed sort of the part of the program where you were uh, kind of dissecting the whole locker situation. Is this going to put that where it needs to be, cumulatively across the city? I can, this menu was prepared last February, March, April. Um, the conversation about Atlantic Middle School apparently came up very recently. I heard uh, that I only became yeah. aware of it uh, yesterday. Um, so it's not in this request. Um, but I likened it to Broadmeadows. It's built within two years, I think, of one another. Um, so Broadmeadows is, if that informs me to Atlantic, then I have no doubt that Atlantic needs some new lockers. So my suggestion was that we go in, we take the inventory of what needs to be done, and we bid that, and I come back for an, a CIP request in the future for that and some firehouse projects that we're doing. Um, and this is kind of like the whole seawall bit. If we change it around now, we run into advertising issues. Um, and we're quite frankly not ready. We don't have the uh, specifications in place for those lockers anyways, so I don't need that funding right now. But. I would be back in the near term to get the funding for those two buildings for the lockers. I mean, I bring that up. Um, obviously, Point Webster's on there, and that had been a conversation that I was, um, you know, invited into, I guess, over the last week or so. And um, at Point, no, I'm sorry, for Point or for That's right, yeah. Okay. So obviously, not having children in the school, right? I don't, I don't look and touch and feel it every single day, but I talked to you know many of the stakeholders and also constituents who send the children there. And um, we met on site last Wednesday. Uh, I yep, yep, I had I had heard of that. The principal just, and um, the vendor and Kevin and myself. This is pretty wild when you think about children going to school, right? And I'm a parent of young children uh, going to school and having to share lockers and not having a locker or having a locker that's broken. Like those conversations, just they shouldn't happen. Period. I agree. Yeah, and I know you do, but um, I just think that we should never get to a point where where that's that's happening. So I'm glad we're addressing it through this for sure. But uh, I was just more surprised than anything to kind of learn that um, that was a condition of reserve comment there. What's that? A reserve comment on that one. This will address that point. Right. 
Which um, is a good, I mean. One of the right. generations of lockers gets repaired and those that are not repairable will be complete replacements. I mean, the good news is we're anticipating about 300 new uh, in the balance repaired. And that, I mean, those sort of templates and work orders move pretty quick and once you get the funding? The, that wouldn't be through the work order system. That's through the vendor that was there last week off of the right. state contract but, list. So his work order moves pretty quick once he has. I, if I get the funding, I can give him the purchase order to get going. He can order it, and it's a six to eight week lead time for the stock, which puts us to Christmas vacation, as suggested. And then if need So you be, would actually target this for Christmas vacation? Well, the kids I would like are, to. Yeah. Yep. Because that was my next question was like, how do you sequence this, right? So the need's immediate. But the kids are in school and. There's a lot of activity, so you target a, a holiday break. I mean, we're not going to wait till the end of the school year to do no, this. As I suggested, the, the workers are authorized and cleared to work in the buildings with the students. Um, it's not the best situation. I prefer not to do it. So we target the Christmas break. Um, failing that would be the February break. But if, if Christine Barrett, the principal, feels it's urgent enough, we could, it, it could advance it and do it during the school. Um, you know, one other thing that comes to mind, I'll just ask you because it has been part of like capital infusions over the past four of a clubhouse. Can you give me a little update there? I actually did receive an email today saying that the uh, ladies' room is no longer in working order. That's first I've heard of that. Um, the and I'm not saying it's not true. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, um, I didn't know if that was part of because, right? I mean, at some well, point. Yes. So, so that's the not. bathrooms are deplorable. Um, they. In the 1970s, they needed to be replaced. They haven't been touched since. Um, HKT, the architect that was engaged a number of years ago, I just uh, last week did a change order on their contract um, because the conceptual designs that they did, I think five years ago at this point, are no longer um, relevant because they were anticipating bathrooms in the building that served the field. And now with the park replacement and improvement, there is a standalone bathroom building. So the bathroom component needs to be redesigned, uh, as yeah. does the front entrance. We could probably um, do without the balconies, too, right? I think that was part of the original charrette that they I, put I, forward. I, I, yeah, I, it was pretty. I, I've ignored that because yeah, I'm not was, interested in doing what they're pretty, doing. Yeah, so the right. structural engineer in Where's there as we speak, um, because the building has some dips in it, um, and the architect's working on the bathroom redesigns, and the front entrance uh, redesigned the flat roof to make a uh, enclosed area for the air handlers, and excuse me, the compressors for the air handlers for the HVAC system, which are reached their uh, end of life and need to be replaced. So the mechanical engineer is working on that aspect of it. So now, we got a, a bunch of designs going on at once and hopefully be ready to, to execute. Because once we take the building offline, I don't want to have it sequential tasks. I want to do it all, you know, coterminous and be in and be out. Uh, and keep the building offline in the shortest period as possible. Now, can you leverage anything through, say, like a mass save program? Mass save is generally for residential. I have a commercial um, component, but I don't know if that would. Yeah, if, if there's any aspect of it, it would be the insulation, uh, which, quite frankly, is the cheapest component of this entire job. Um, so, I mean, Nothing. we'll certainly investigate it, but. Yeah, I mean, and they, they, and they generally do a reimbursement. It would be upfront, anyways, and then they come back and they'll do incentives. Um, the same we do on lighting and other uh, installation projects. Well, remember, we have someone who may be interested in helping with a lighting template down there, so that we met on site. So I just ask you to kind of keep that stuff in mind because it's a it's a pretty substantial project, and obviously the the funding is. Uh, not nearly what the need is, right? So you just kind of chip away at it over time. Right. But there are folks that want to participate. Um, but, but that's one of the reasons for this design now is so there's a master plan. So chipping away, you don't do something that prohibits you from doing something else you need to do. You, you phase them and sequence oh, right. them. So it's, it's uh, in concert, not in conflict. First things first, so I agree. And yep. I just want to point out too, because it's impressive their advocacy is, you know, um, obviously the, the leadership of public safety I see both chiefs back there from fire and police, but also the members of Local 792, who I received the phone call from um, today as well, just leading up to it. They're, they're their own advocates. And, um, you know, when you contemplate just the dangers that come with uh, public safety work, it's, it's pretty amazing. One of the uh, best investments that I made as a city councilor was I was given the opportunity to go out to the fire academy in Stowe 
And uh, although they were burning straw fires, which seemed much, much larger when you were in person, it really gave me a perspective as to, uh, you know, what a glimpse into that, that type of work is. And, you know, as we're looking at uh, upgrading basically the breathing apparatus, uh, one thing that I learned is a lot of that's charged right now through regular batteries, AAA batteries, right? The, the, essentially triggers the response internally and lets folks know how much oxygen they have uh, in their tank, which is, that was news to me. So with uh, the investment of capital here, you know, you're going to put the, uh, you know, the men and women of the fire department in the best position possible, you know, and obviously the most adverse times. So um, this, is a, this is a called for investment, I think, collectively across the board. It's pretty amazing how much uh, work, financial resources, time, everything that goes into maintaining a city. And I think what we've seen, what I've heard from you, just in your explanations about different things, is kind of when you fall short in those areas, um, sort of all comes at once, right? So hopefully we're getting on uh, incremental um, cycle from here on out because they are, they are assets that you need to maintain, much like your home. So Absolutely. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great, thanks. All right, there's a motion on the floor to approve. All those in favor? Those opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. That all. concludes our finance committee meeting. I'd like to call the regularly scheduled city council meeting back to order. Uh, we have communications and reports from the mayor, other city officers, and city boards, and Madam Clerk. Uh, I do have one uh, grant of location this evening. Uh, Mass Electric and Verizon request permission to install a pole on Mechanic Street. I will um, ask that you refer to public works in advertising. Absolutely. Any other communications? What's that? No, we're, we're getting there. Anybody else? Okay. Um, reports of committees. Councilor Kane. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, tonight, the Finance Committee uh, met and discussed Order Number 2009-087, uh, Move for Positive Approval. Motion made by Councilor Kane, second by Council McCarthy. <clears throat> Excuse me, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Hughes. Yes. Councilor Liang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. Nine members. Nine members. The item passes. Uh, the Finance Committee also deliberated order number 2019-088. Uh, motion approving $10,316,320.38 for capital improvements. Uh, move for positive approval. Motion made by Council Kane, second by, excuse me, Council McCarthy. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Kane. Yes. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Yes. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. Nine members. Nine members. All set, Council? Yes. You good? Uh, any other reports of committees? Council Palmucci? Yes, if I may, a little housekeeping in the Oversight Committee. I would uh, remove from committee Council Order 2018-179 and move for uh, to postpone indefinitely. Can you explain to the body what that is? Just to do nothing, just to take it out of committee and lay it on the table. No action. 
I'm just I'm just cleaning up matters that are pending in the oversight okay. committee that so have no further purpose. They're we're all just my trying to interpret up here what it is. They're like, all my motions. That's the uh, resolve about the effect of the national grid lockout on public safety in the city's public. Okay, so you want to take it out of take it out of committee, postpone indefinitely. Okay. Do you need a second on that? Yeah. Yeah, second. Motion made, seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clark, please. I don't think we need a roll. We could just do it by a voice vote if you wanted to. That's, well, we can do a roll. Madam right. Clark. Councilor Kane. Yes. Like six more. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Hughes. Yes. Councilor Leang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Pelmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. Nine members. Uh, same matter, taking out 2018-180, uh, which is an order for consideration of the testimony of Natural Grid President Marcy Reed. I move we postpone indefinitely. Okay, motion. What's that? Motion. Yep, Council did, did we ever get a response from uh, the president? Uh, he, uh, the response was she didn't show up when we ordered her to. Oh, and right. then our, our, the city solicitor was in negotiations with National Grid about sending a suitable replacement if that would meet our uh, needs. And then the strike was settled and the matter fell off. Mm, so, lockout. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, lockout, very big difference, right? Lockout, yeah. You all side counsel? Ken? I am. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I hear she's very lovely though. Maybe one day we will get to meet her. If we're lucky. Yeah. Uh, okay, motion made by Councilor Palmucci, seconded by Councilor Yang. Uh, Madam Clark, please call the roll. Councilor Kane. Yes. Councilor DeBona. Yes. Councilor Harris. Yes. Councilor Hughes. Yes. Councilor Yang. Yes. Councilor Mahoney. Yes. Councilor McCarthy. Yes. Councilor Palmucci. Yes. President Crow. Yes. Nine members. And then last one, 2019-7 uh, is a resolve relative to St. Mary's school property update, I'd uh, seek to remove that committee and postpone it, remove that from committee and postpone it indefinitely. Motion made by Council Palmochi, second by Council Liang. Any discussion? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Council Kane. Yes. Council DeBona. Yes. Council Harris. Yes. Council Hughes. Yes. Council Liang. Yes. Council Mahoney. Council McCarthy. Yes. Council Palmucci. Yes. President Kroll. Yes. Nine members. Great, all set? Brian? I'm all set. Thank all right, you thank you. Uh, any other reports, committees? Nothing? Okie doke. Presentations of petitions, memorials, and remonstrance. Council de Bona? Did you? you had your hand earlier, right? Uh, so. Yeah, just, just wanted to say uh, um, that our Patriot Ledger um, reporter here, Erin Turnin, is going to be leaving um, the ledger going on to the Herald, and I just want to thank her for her hard work with updating the city of Quincy. <laughs> and the people of, of Quincy and the Patriot Ledger doing our articles, that's all. And she's leaving tomorrow? Tomorrow's her last day. Tomorrow's did you, her last did day. you want to say anything? Uh, well, thank you, as all. Come on up to the microphone. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to thank you guys all for um, being so candid with me and always being available when I had questions or needed to talk to you, so thank you. Who's gonna fill your shoes? We don't know yet. but. <gasps> I'll make sure that they let you know. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. But in, in general, thank thank you for your time and energy in here and, and the different personalities that you came Are across. Are we not with. interesting enough anymore? <laughs> <laughs> uh, City Hall in Boston. That's you, you know, it's funny. The previous one, Sean Carter, went to the Herald as well. <laughs> Three of the last four. Well, Patrick Ronan's over at um, Father, Father Bill's. So, but anyways. <laughs> but thank you, thank you for everything. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Mm -hmm. Councilor Yang. Thank you, Mr. President. I just wanted to um, just very quickly congratulate um, somebody who has done a lot of really great work here in the city. Um, she is a member over at Tobin Towers at 80 Clay Street, and she is just one of many of our senior residents across the city who. Um, you know, live in these senior buildings across the city who are part of tenant associations, uh, community groups are really active in making sure that everyone who calls our senior buildings home really feels at home. And uh, Miss Lee is leaving 80 Clay Street, unfortunately, to go full time into rehab. And uh, we did have a small sort of send off for her this last week. And I just want to 
take this moment to thank uh, my fellow colleague, Councillor Mahoney, as well as the mayor and uh, Representative Fruseyers for joining us um, to send her off. Again, you know, it was a really special moment. She is in a building where there is a huge Asian population and everyone in that building, regardless of what their background is, um, comes together for every holiday and every event because of folks like her. So I just want to congratulate her. Again, thank my colleagues for joining me and sending her off. And also take the moment to thank everyone um, who does the work in the, the senior buildings across the city because they really do make that feel like home. So thank you. Thank you, Council. Any other uh, presentations or petitions, memorials, some remonstrance? Seeing none, motions, orders, and resolutions. Okie doke. Scheduling of committee meetings. Obviously, you have that in front of you. Monday, October 7th, we'll be back in this room with ordinance at 6.30, as well as uh, SPGA, and then the regularly scheduled city council meetings. Does anybody else want to put a council hours? Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, I'd like to schedule on Monday, October 24th. First, uh, at 7.25, public hearing, grant of Mass Electric Verizon on Mechanic Street. Nope. On the 25th. On October 21st. Yep, absolutely. You got that, John? Yep. You go. Okay. Any, uh, any other meetings need to be scheduled? All right, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Conclude the city council meeting at 9, 10 p.m.